March 2012. In the district of Schwabing, the apartment of an 80-year-old recluse called Cornelius Gurlitt is about to be raided. Little did people know that what would be found there would open up a Pandora's box involving Nazi loot, degenerate art, and Hitler's own private museum. Cornelius Gerlitz is not a name that will be familiar to many people until this year. Um, someone that lived as a recluse in Munich in a very modest flat. He's a bit of an enigma. He was a loner but we don't really know much about him. Well, he was a very interesting man. It wouldn't be surprising if he had a slightly, uh, slightly strange upbringing and some effect from that. He wasn't seen much out and about and was someone who hasn't even watched television since 1963. He's really lived completely a, a solitary life. As the investigators poured through the collection of this solitary man, they uncovered over a thousand works by the likes of Matisse, Picasso, Chagall, and Otto Dix, some of which were previously unknown. There are things we think, where did that come from? You know, where has that been for the last 60 years? Which is, you know, exactly what Cornelius Gerlitt wanted. It uh, has lived a rather pathetic, lonely life with all these pictures. I wonder if it's, uh, if it's all true. When the story was broken by Focus magazine, it captured the world's attention. Who was Cornelius Gurnett? How had he stayed undetected for so long? And just where did all of these artworks come from? The answer to all of these questions begins in the town of Zwickau in Eastern Germany in 1930. Zwickau was the hometown of Cornelius Gerlitz's father, Hildebrand Gerlitz. He came from a well-known artistic family and worked in the galleries at the Koenig Albert Museum. Hildebrand Gerlitz was um, an art historian, a good art historian and a dealer, and he worked for various German museums. He was known as being someone who had close links with the avant-garde art world in Germany um, with a lot of the modern expressionist painters of the day. The first exhibition he put on was Max Pechstein, which was, you know, quite alternative at that time. Um, and he did work with artists like Kate Kollwitz, a lot of the Expressionists. Um, so he was seen as really quite radical. And I think, you know, a lot of people enjoyed the exhibitions, but the kind of local traditionalists saw him as, yeah, this kind of radical young guy who'd come in and really shaken things up and stick out. But with the Nazis coming to power in 1933 and Hitler's hatred of the modern art movement, Hildebrand found himself out of a job in Zwickau and forced by the Nazis to resign a new position he'd found in Hamburg soon after. Hildebrand was not welcome in this new cultural era of Germany. Modern art was declared an enemy of the state and culminated in the Entartete Kunst, or so-called Degenerate Art Exhibition of 1937. The Nazis really felt very concerned about modern art, the avant-garde in Germany at that time. I and mean, it's a testament to how powerful that art is. It was a genuine worry for them. And they really wanted to outlaw it and ban it. And also use it, I think, for their own propaganda. Is if you're against our regime, you'll end up like these people. You'll be mad. You'll be completely against the norm, basically. When Hitler, in order to try and uh, focus the German nation's psyche on its future and its purity and its superiority. And he wanted to connect the German nation in his definition the best forms of art. He ordered a exhibition to be held of all this degenerate art. <laughs> So they mounted actually two exhibitions at the same time. There was one of German art, really for the last 2,000 years, 
Then at the same time, down the road in Munich, there was the Antarctica Kunst exhibition, uh, which actually had more visitors than the other one, unsurprisingly. There was a huge exhibition held in Munich in 1937 uh, with paintings which they despised, uh, presented with slogans against modern art that which were written on the walls. And this exhibition attracted two million visitors in Munich, which is an amazing number. And it then went on to tour other German cities. Uh, but it is most unusual to hold an exhibition of art that you despise. I think a lot of um, the journalists at that time who had been closely linked to avant-garde circles found it really hard because they were under pressure to write very scornful and scathing reports about the exhibition, saying how, how horrendous all this work was. Can you imagine, you know, if somebody put on a show of sort of accepted British art now and then art you're not allowed to see, of course you go to the one you're not allowed to see, I mean, the kind of hideous art. There were many people who went to see it and many were horrified by it. It was absolute chaos in there. Everything was hung, stacked up on the walls. Paintings were lopsided. Things were propped against the wall. Some were unframed, some were framed. And they had graffiti explaining why each work was degenerate. So even if you couldn't figure it out for yourself, you were told. Whereas in the other exhibition, it was all very classical, monumental nudes uh, representing classicism and longevity, all the things that Hitler wanted to build into his Aryan race. Four times as many people went to the Jinnit Art Show as the, uh, as the Corso Show. And, um, you know, maybe Hitler was a secret modernist, who knows? I mean, certainly he exposed more Germans to modern art than would ever have seen it if he hadn't put that show on. The Antarctica Kunst Exhibition was organized by the Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda, headed by Joseph Goebbels. Deutsche Männer und Frauen, das Zeitalter eines überspitzten jüdischen Intellektualismus ist nun zu Ende. And some of them went to look at it because they thought they'll never see it again. There had already been the book burnings earlier that year where they'd burnt works by many, many modern writers. Um, so really it was a, maybe a death knell to those avant-garde artists and their work. So a lot of people who were sympathised went um, at the same time as a lot of people going just to have a kind of scoff and laugh at it. There were several reasons why the Nazis despised so-called degenerate art. Um, Hitler himself personally was very, very conventional in his artistic taste and disliked modern art. Some of the artists um, who made the modern art, like Chagall, for example, uh, were Jewish, and uh, the Nazis obviously despised them for that reason. And there was also a very strong streak of conventionality in Nazi thought. They espoused old-fashioned traditional values, and modern art seemed to just run counter to that. The era of degenerate art may have ended Hildebrand Gerlitz's promising early career, but he had even more pressing concerns. He did have kind of Jewish blood in him, which would have made him slightly vulnerable to the Nazis. He was what they called a second second level Michelin, wasn't he? So I mean, he was a quarter Jewish. It was probably better to play along. Hildebrand's heritage and his love of modernism would have seemingly ended any chance of a career in the art business. But amazingly, he was hired by the Nazis to work as a dealer on behalf of the state. When the Nazis were getting rid of degenerate art, he was singled out as one of a handful of major dealers who were entrusted with the task of selling off the art. So that's where he got quite a lot of his pictures, and he was quite interested in modern art. He was able to ingratiate himself with the Nazis because of his understanding of the whole of the Jewish and other collectors of, of that current generation of art, and become one of the main individuals who helped them loot art around Europe. He went on to work with the Nazis as one of four dealers who were charged with basically making some money out of the modernist or degenerate art as they saw it. I think there's a quote that says something like, we've got to make some money out of this rubbish. So they just wanted to get it out of Germany and sell it off um, and get foreign currency in as well. He would argue that he'd saved some of the art by um, selling it off to foreign collectors rather than allowing the Nazis to destroy it. Hildebrand had a talent for gaining access to artworks and he was soon buying pieces directly from those who had to sell as they were being persecuted or were forced to flee the country. 
This is my offer for all nine of the drawings. It is a fair offer, I believe. Good, good. I'll arrange collection, handle all the details. It's very difficult to get inside the minds of people and uh, um, it was a very difficult period and people did things uh, that we would now regard as wrong in many cases. The art will be safe at least. It is the art that you're saving. Yes, of course. They've already dismissed me from my gallery. If they think I'm offering generous terms, I, I have a family. I'm a quarter Jewish. One doesn't know precisely why he dealt with uh, the Nazis, but uh, the most obvious reason is that it was a way of making money. This was a very comfortable, easy life that got him out of uh, all the problems of the rest of the war. And the money must have been extremely good at a time when, unless you were in the armaments business, it was very difficult to make any money. I'll send, from, I'll send my man for, for the paintings this afternoon. Doctor? Hildebrand Gerlitt would soon become one of the biggest dealers on behalf of the Nazis. The choice he had made would take him to Paris, where his mission was to acquire works for the Führer's own personal collection from Nazi-occupied France. The 2012 Munich Artworks discovery had thrown light on the life and career of the man who had acquired the collection, one Hildebrand Gerlitt. He had started out as a respected museum director, but with the Nazis coming to power, he became a key part of the commission for the exploitation of degenerate art. Works were bought directly from those being persecuted and were seized for the Entartete Kunst exhibition. Hildebrand was able to build up his own collection as he worked to sell these so-called degenerate art pieces abroad, from where they were stored in the Schönhausen Palace near Berlin. In the process, he was able to hoard many works for himself. This is how a number of paintings by the German artist Otto Dix, who featured heavily in the Degenerate Art Exhibition, wound up in Cornelius Gerlitz's apartment in Munich. Otto Dix was heavily featured. Obviously, his work is quite shocking visually, very caricatured. People saw it as really horrifying, couldn't understand why he would choose to represent the human figure and face in that way. During the First World War, Dix was very shocked by what he saw, and a lot of his pictures show the savagery of the fighting. And the Nazis despised his paintings as degenerate, and he was categorised as such. But another artist that was interestingly very vilified was Emil Nolde, who actually had been a member of the Nazi party and a real sympathiser from quite early on. But he was the artist that had the most works of any of them, had 27 works featured in the exhibition, and he was the one that had said, you know, I am a Nazi sympathizer, I stand up for what you believe in. And there's a very sad story about him, who's very elderly going to, after the exhibition, going to the authorities and saying, you know, I'm, I'm a sympathizer, please can you release my work? And they refused. And he had very important crucifixion work, which they wouldn't give him back, despite his allegiance to the party. The label degenerate even applied to music with an Intartata music exhibition also being staged. It was a bizarre and terrifying time for anyone working in the arts in Germany, and Hildebrand Gerlitt was caught right up in the middle of it. I think we all want to see the kind of Nazi epoch in terms of black and white, and I think a lot of people were both black and white, and certainly before the war, he was incredibly white. He was passionate about modernism, and then the next thing you know, he's in Paris <laughs> expropriating art from Paul Rosenberg and, and the Rothschilds and, you know, doing, doing rather kind of dreadful things. It was in Paris that Hildebrand took full advantage of his new position of power. 
the Entartida Kunst exhibition had made some of the best modern expressionist paintings available. But with the Nazis having taken control of France, some of the greatest art of the era was within reach. Paris has always been an important centre of the art market, particularly in the 20th century. So it's no surprise that a German dealer would have very good and close contacts with Paris and spend time there. The best art of all belonged to Paul Rosenberg. He'd managed to escape just in time, but the same could not be said for his whole collection. He's an incredibly important dealer and came from a family of dealers, so he really had it in his lineage. And he was most famously Picasso's dealer from 1918 to 1940. He and Picasso were like sort of family, weren't they? They, um, they lived next door to each other and they spent holidays together and it was, you know, um, it was a love thing. He was also a dealer for Matisse from 1936. So he really had the big names and his gallery was on Rue La Boite and it was really known as the kind of hub in Paris of these modern artists that were breaking the mold. You could find them all there with Paul Rosenberg. Rosenberg was one of the most important dealers, particularly in modernist works, um, the post-impressionist, early 20th century works. He was among the most important dealers for that period. Well, he was kind of Mr. Cubism, really, wasn't he? He, um, he and his brother Léon were the big um, sellers of, of mid-period Cubism, and they internationalised it, and they, um, you know, they opened a, a gallery in London, a gallery in New York, and they sold museum modern art, and were, you know, had massive collections and were massively rich. When things became more tense in Europe, he started to get nervous and did ship off a lot of his collection, which was very, very extensive. So it was went to South America, Australia, and also to London and New York, his galleries. But unfortunately, he didn't get everything out. And in 1940, he fled to New York, managed to get a visa, got his family out very quickly. But there were, I think, over 2,000 works left. Paul Rosenberg's confiscated collection, along with all other art labelled degenerate in France, was stored at the Jeu de Paume Gallery in Paris. Hildebrand Gerlitt was then able to purchase these works at knockdown prices at the nearby Drouot auction house. Many sales were made at the Drouot auction house, and that continued during the Second World War. And it was a place to trade in the work of the Impressionists, in post-Impressionists. Between 1941 and 1945, while Gerlitt was living and working in Paris, he was able to add top quality paintings to his already impressive collection. But as the tide of the war turned against Germany, he needed to find a way to keep them for himself. As chaos reigned towards the end of the war, from about the early 1944 period, when it was clear that the war was lost and the Russians were approaching, there were a lot of people who spent most of their time thinking about how they're going to survive at the end of the war. And for somebody like him in a very privileged position to move art to secret locations where he could say he was trying to sell it for the Nazis, but actually he was keeping it for himself at the end of the war. Having noted the warning signs, Hildebrand Gerlitt moved swiftly and managed to relocate much of his art collection away from his home in Dresden. They were kept on a farm outside Dresden and then they were in some sort of nameless castle in some nameless town in nameless southern Germany. It doesn't seem to be a collection that was put together with love. You know, it seems a kind of expedient collection. It looks like the kind of collection that was designed to be sold quietly not raise too many eyebrows. It was fortunate that Hildebrand was able to get the works away from the city of Dresden, given what was about to happen.
approaching, the firebombing of Dresden provided him with an ideal cover story. Well, he had a home in Dresden, um, and actually his street was bombed. So I think Hildebrand saw it as a very obvious and clear solution to their hoard. I think they just said, you know, our street was bombed, all the records have gone, all the art's gone, we don't have anything, we have no letters, we've got nothing. And it made complete sense because it was actually bombed and no one knew that I think Hildebrand had actually taken the art out at the very, very last minute when the Allies were approaching. So there was no reason really why it wouldn't be true that it was bombed. Hildebrand Gerlitt had another secret though. He had been hired to find works of art for Hitler himself and in the process had greatly expanded his own collection. His pretense that it had all been destroyed in Dresden was successful. For over half a century, the hoard was considered lost to the world. And it would have remained so had his son Cornelius not tried to sell one of his paintings just a couple of years ago. A sale that would see the net begin to close in on this 60-year-old crime. The firebombing of Dresden could have wiped out most of the artworks found in Cornelius Gerlitz's Munich apartment in 2012. But his father, Hildebrand Gerlitz, had been smart enough to transport his collection of over a thousand works away from the city. When World War II came to an end, Hildebrand had managed to get away with storing these artworks in a secret location, thought to be on the outskirts of Dresden. He was able to return to his pre-war career in the art market, but died suddenly in a car crash in 1956. His son Cornelius then succeeded in moving the cache of works into the Schwabing apartment in 1960. They remained here for over 50 years, where every night Cornelius would take the paintings out of storage to admire them. Well, it does seem that he just inherited the pictures. The son enjoyed them um, privately and would look at them and saw no reason why he should sell them or do anything with them. So uh, the status quo continued and he just took over his father's picture collection. Anybody who is the son of somebody with as extraordinary a career as his father and the constant moves and uh, times that his father was under suspicion and worked for both the Nazis and the Allies, he must have known that his father had been playing both sides of the street. And that may well, I think, have set up various tensions within him. Cornelius had remained hidden from society for all this time. But with no state health insurance in his old age, he was forced to enter the art market himself and sell one of his paintings for much needed funds. Spending so much time alone, Cornelius was known to write what he intended to say on cue cards when faced with a conversation. Good afternoon. This is the painting that I wish to sell. Good afternoon. This is the painting that I wish to sell. Cornelius Gerlitt decided to part with this important work by Max Beckman, The Lion Tamer, because he was getting increasingly ill. And I think really out of desperation, he just decided to sell one uh, via an auction house in Cologne. The auction house sent a representative as they do to come and do evaluation. And uh, she came in expecting, I'm not sure what, into a very gloomy, dark flat. Mr. Gurlitt, I'm Ms. Balman from the auction house. We spoke on the phone. Yes. Come in. She had no uh, inkling of what else was hiding in that flat. How did you come by it? Was it in your family? My mother's. You don't have any more then? No, this is the only one. This is the painting that I wish to sell. Well, when it was taken to the German auction house, Lempertz, 
uh, it was very clearly in the provenance, his father's name was up in lights. And his father's name is on our red flag list. Any picture we see anywhere in the world with his name, we undertake extensive research. So it would have been immediately obvious to Lempertz that this picture was claimed by the family uh, of the victims of the original persecution. And so the normal thing then is to contact the family and to say to them, this picture's coming up for sale, and there is a deal that could be done whereby you should get some of the proceeds. Whether they knew at the time the exact circumstances under which he'd held it is probably doubtful. They probably thought he'd got it in possibly good faith. That's highly debatable now, I think. He made an arrangement uh, with the heirs of the pre-war owner, so they agreed to split um, the proceeds, and it just went on the market as a normal picture and wasn't particularly closely examined. I would like to know what was in the collection in 1956, um, before Hildebrand died, and how much of that has been sold off quietly in the intervening years. But by selling the Lion Tamer, Cornelius had started the process that would lead to his eventual downfall. He was merely following the example of his father Hildebrand, though, who had been expected to generate funds by selling modern paintings. But he also had another major role, to purchase or otherwise acquire works for the Führer himself. Hitler had grand plans for his own purpose-built Führer museum in his hometown of Linz, and he needed the greatest works in history to fit it. His desire to make a mark in the art world had started from a very young age when he first moved to Vienna in 1905. When he was young, Hitler wanted to become an artist and he applied uh, to study at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna and was turned down twice. He was rejected straight out without even interview, so he really got a slap in the face from that. He felt uh, rejected um, at a crucial point in his career. I think that made him uh, dislike the art establishment. And by this time, the art establishment had been seen as supporting the development of modern and 20th century art. He does believe that there is a kind of cons a, a world conspiracy, not specifically against him, but about people against people like him, people with his kind of taste. And it's these nasty, interchangeable, <laughs> sort of deranged Jewish Bolshevik uh, folk who like that kind of painting. Vienna, at the start of the early 20th century, was the home of a bustling new artistic community that Hitler simply did not fit into. In Vienna, there was no doubt there was a very libertarian, rather degenerate feeling to the city. And it's quite clear that in Vienna at the time, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was, was, was falling to bits. I think it's, it's what had happened in Paris sort of 25 years before. Was you'd had a kind of imperial heavy hand um, suddenly, um, in the case of the French, was lifted by Napoleon III being got rid of. In, in Vienna, it was just, you know, poor old Franz Josef had been there for 50 years by that time. And I think also it was the city of Sigmund Freud, because one thing that all of these things have in common is, is kind of psychic introspection um, and a kind of an idea of the possibility of madness. Um, and that, of course, went down like a cup of cold sick with the Nazis. They didn't like that sort of thing at all. I think in Vienna, was, what was incredible was a real mix of all the different arts, as it were. So there was the birth of atonal music happened in Vienna. You had a new psychological study from Freud. You had artists like Klimt and then the next generation following him, showing an emotional response to art that was about the internal rather than the external. So it was coming from all directions. It was music, it was theatre, it was literature, it was art. It was a real sort of hotbed for this new avant-garde, a new way of seeing and thinking. There was some great work done in mathematics and science. Uh, there was some great work done in psychology, but you can see a lot of people would have felt that that was all pretty strange and a bit unsettling. Uh, and there was some, in many ways, great art, but what would be to them, and even now, rather shocking in some ways. It was very exciting, the early 20th century in Vienna. I mean, culturally, there were a lot of avant-garde artists who were really pushing the boundaries. In Vienna, at the time when Hitler was living there in the early 20th century, there was quite a conflict between um, the avant-garde and the traditional art, which uh, was the art that Hitler espoused. 
Hitler's traditional style, which included watercolors and drab sketches of the sites of Vienna, were not going to cut it in this new modern art scene. But his enormous political success allowed Hitler to finally fulfill his artistic ambitions with the construction of the Führer Museum in his country of birth, Austria. The Führer Museum was going to be in Austria and Linz, which was the hometown of Hitler, and he really wanted to construct this enormous pantheon of the culture of the New Reich. It would be an art museum, but not only that, a library, opera house, theatre, everything to do with his new imposed culture would be here in this enormous great symbol of his power. He's not the only man, he's not the only megalomaniac man who has seen that a museum is maybe the best way to have your, your name set for posterity. As ambitious as the Führer Museum was on its own, it was actually only a part of the grand restructuring of the entire city of Linz. Really quite early on in 1936, he had already spoken to his head architect at that time. It was going to be 500 feet long, you know, Arbitsphere, lots and lots and lots of columns, peristyles, um, all the usual Nazi claptrap. He poured over the plans, poured over what works he wanted to get, and then he went on a really a rampage across the countries that they're invading, taking works from Jewish families, from museums. A lot of religious art was taken from churches, even in Germany, and stored them at that time, ready for the Führer Museums. And it was a kind of degree of thought that went into it, because it was, you know, it was going to be the Central Museum of the Reich. It was going to have a collection that effectively showed the whole course of art history leading to Germany. Every single masterpiece from right across time would be housed here in that museum. And people were going to come from all over the Reich to Linz to see it. So there was also the Adolf Hitler Hotel as part of the complex, because of course they would have to have somewhere to stay when they got there. One of the people entrusted with acquiring works for this audacious museum was Hildebrand Gerlitt. During his time in Paris, Gerlitt was a big time buyer who acquired major works. He even spent five million francs on a Cezanne landscape painting of the Valley de l'Arc, which later proved to be a fake. But he wasn't alone in trying to acquire works for Hitler. Dr. Hans Posse, a close confidant of the Führer, was tasked with seizing the most challenging paintings to obtain, including works by Johannes Vermeer. Hitler's taste ran mostly to German and Austrian romantic 19th century art, so he, I, I imagine there would have been lots of um, Caspar David Friedrich and that sort of stuff. But the chap who was buying for him was, uh, was a great expert in, in Netherlandish and Flemish art. So, I mean, there was, you know, there were two Vermeers, for example, I and mean, there were going to be lots and lots of the odd Michelangelo, you know, big stuff. If you're going to found a museum, you've got to have, if it's going to be the great pictures of the world, some of the great Dutch and Italian masters. There were two masterpieces by Vermeer which were destined for the Führer Museum. Uh, one of which was bought and one of which was stolen. Now the bought one was called the Artist Studio, very, very important work by Vermeer. And Hitler actually bought that directly from Count Zernan himself for quite a lot of money, but his descendants are now contesting it's still a case that's, that's going on as we speak. The other was stolen from the Rothschild family as part of the hoard taken from them. The Führer Museum, along with other grand schemes for the reconstruction of Linz, never got past the design stage. But many artworks had already been acquired, ready to be moved in. They had been stored in Munich, but with the threat of bombing, the hall was moved for safekeeping to a salt mine in the Austrian region of Altersee. They were boxed up, sent there, and no one really knew much else about it. When the war in Europe came to an end, the Allies managed to track down the salt mine in Altersee. Inside, they were able to recover both the astronomer and the artist's studio. They also managed to reclaim a stolen bust by Michelangelo and the priceless Ghent altarpiece, all of which were taken in preparation for the Führer Museum. The Ghent altarpiece was a, um, a seminal work, I think that's the right expression, by the Van Eichs, and it, it set a, a, a tone and a procedure for things that makes it historically enormously important. But I think perhaps the most valuable painting taken during the war were those various Vermeers that were stolen you know, individually. Even for Hitler, getting hold of Vermeer's and 
pictures of that quality, not easy. I mean, it's just really very fortunate that those were not destroyed. I mean, there were quite a lot of very good pictures, which we're pretty certain were destroyed, uh, i.e. there's records of where they were, and it's known that that place was uh, bombed or damaged or flooded or whatever, uh, and uh, the pictures were destroyed. Just as Hitler's secret hoard had been recovered at the end of the war, time was running out for Cornelius Gerlitz's stash in his Munich apartment. And a trip to Switzerland would prove to be his final undoing. Until 2010, Cornelius Gerlitz's remarkable cache of over 1,400 artworks was still unknown to the world. He had managed to successfully sell the Lion Tamer painting by Max Beckman for quick funds. But his luck started to run out when he was stopped at a customs point on a train from Switzerland. Well, Gerlitz was on a train and uh, from Z Zurich uh, to Munich, and uh, he was stopped by German customs officials who were just doing, we believe, just doing routine checks. And he was found to have a substantial amount of cash with him. He had on him a 9,000 euros, which is just under the limit of what you have to declare coming out of Switzerland. This was a trade from Zurich to Munich. And then they looked for his identity papers and this, that and the other, and he appeared to be a rather strange individual. Hence, the Germans then raided his flat. He had no tax um, references, no health insurance. He's someone who's been kind of completely off the radar of the German authorities. So they were quite surprised to find him with this huge loot. I mean, I think, you know, they thought, why is this old man carrying 9,000 euros from Switzerland? As I say, it's an entirely legal thing to do, but I suppose it raised questions. I must have flagged him up on some horrible tax database somewhere. I would not be at all surprised if in fact his name was on the list of those individuals who had German, Germans with bank accounts in Switzerland. There have been some whistleblowers in the Swiss banks who gave these lists of names to the American and German intelligence services. So I wonder whether, in fact, they hadn't spotted him, as it were, from one of those lists. When will you bring them back? Finding 1,400 works of art in Germany is just the start of the treasure hunt. The cramped London offices of the Art Loss Register have been besieged ever since German prosecutors announced the discovery of works by masters such as Marc Chagall, Henri Matisse and Pablo Picasso. The race is now on to find the rightful owners. Well, what is unusual is the sheer size of the collection, um, 1,400 um, pictures and drawings. Ranging from works on paper right through to oil paintings. It's got a lot of the German expressionists in there, people like Emil Knowles, Max Pechstein, um, right through to Picasso's, Matisse's. Um, so it's really quite broad, and it's said to um, be of value over a billion euros. It's slightly unfortunate the whole thing was kept very quiet for about a year or so, and it only emerged later when a German magazine discovered what had happened and published a story that it came out. And I say it's important to come out, but if there are claimants for the pictures, um, it's important that they're all uh, recorded um, publicly so we know what's out there. At least one of the works found in the Munich apartment, a Matisse painting of a seated woman, is thought to have belonged to Paul Rosenberg. There's been a lot of criticism on the case that there haven't been so uh, very detailed inventory released, which is against the established policy of how you should deal with stolen art. And the family of Paul Rosenberg are already questioning whether this is their seated woman. The recovery process of Paul Rosenberg's stolen paintings has been long and arduous. It started right at the end of World War II with Rosenberg's son. Lieutenant Rosenberg 
was the son of Paul Rosenberg, who was the Parisian dealer who went fled to New York uh, at the start of the war, who had been the um, the dealer for all these great Matisse and Picasso and people like that. And he found some of his father's pictures and as well as all the other things. And it's fascinating. I mean, there's still 70 Picassos missing, aren't there, in the world um, from the war. And lots of Paul Rosenberg's collections still unaccounted for. But that's a separate part of history because then Paul Rosenberg's granddaughter is Anne Sinclair. She's a wonderful lady and she's pursuing the pictures in her own way through the courts and is, is actively involved in that at the moment. So you can see this evolution of how the stolen art um, is, is, is recovered if it belongs to Anne Sinclair and her family, the descendants of Paul Rosenberg, then I, I think they have every right to make a claim for it. However, just six months after his story was revealed to the world, Cornelius Gerlitt passed away following ill health after heart surgery. During that time, it was discovered that he held even further paintings in two properties he owned in Austria. These included works by Renoir and Monet. In a surprising twist, though, the Bern Museum of Fine Arts revealed that they'd been named the sole heir of Cornelius Gerlitz's collection, despite him having had no connection to the institution during his lifetime. But the restitution process of many of the works in the collection could continue for a long time. It's extremely complex working with restitution, tracing back and uh, trying to figure out who actually owns these paintings and in what circumstances they went from the family or owner pre-war and into the hands of Hildebrand Gerlitz. So it's going to be a lot of research, very detailed, and who knows how long it's going to take and, and actually if we'll ever know the full history and provenance of every single work. Well, I think one of the lessons of this is that um, uh, the art trade has to be more open and um, people buying at auction have to ask more questions about the works. This is happening more now and there's been increasing focus in the last 10 years on provenance. Um, but I think the Gerlich case shows the importance of monitoring it carefully and people asking questions. By and large, the rule of thumb, so far as right and wrong is concerned, if the Nazis have had anything to do with any art deal between the mid-30s and 1946, they must always lose. It's a, it's a principle. It's not a, anybody's law or anything like that. It's just a kind of modern principle, which I agree with. So, could there be any more Cornelius Gerlitz out there with hidden masterpieces just waiting to be found? To get well into the 21st century and for these things still to be coming up it is quite a... Quite an eye opener. I don't think they're going to be everywhere. I think it's probably a very rare case. There are quite a lot of people who've got the odd work or two, but, but something of this scale has not emerged in uh, many, many years. I think it's unlikely there are many people who've got something of that size stashed away secretly. I think this is a real one off, and the fact that he was such a reclusive character made this possible, but it's certainly not going to be something that happens every day. It will probably take years to sort out the pictures and what category they fall into and whether any were looted. And the whole saga will take a long time to resolve. antique store in London, a remarkable discovery has been made that has thrown light on the bloody end of the Tsars of Russia and the birth of the Soviet Union. Well, it was a, a miracle. We were here at Wartsky and in through that very door behind you walked a gentleman. He was the most unassuming, unprepossessing individual, but in his hands he had a sheaf of photographs. This mysterious stranger had pictures of a lost treasure made by the legendary Karl Fabergé, a master jeweler and favorite of the Russian imperial court. Like the Romanovs, Fabergé himself would ultimately be a victim of the terrifying Russian Revolution. And one of his greatest creations would go missing for a century, having to survive two world wars and a precarious trip to America before picking
pictures of it finally made their way to London. This has been the target of our dreams for so long that I recognized it instantaneously. But of course, as an antique dealer, your first reaction is no. You doubt everything. But looking at the images and then looking at him, it had to be true. 50 Imperial Fabergé eggs are known to have been made. Could one of the missing ones have finally been found? Of course, we couldn't confirm that until we'd handled the object itself. St. Petersburg, Russia. It was in 1917, in this elegant city on the Baltic Sea, that the story of the Carl Fabergé Company and their legendary imperial eggs came to a crashing end. This is where you made them. The workshop's downstairs. We design, we used to design our products in here. The eggs. Not just commissions from His Majesty. Citizen Romanov. Citizen Romanov. It's a time capsule, it's a, it's a portal. I mean, we, in Russian history, we have this fault line of 1917, and each and every one of these pieces catapults us back to that time when there were beautiful grand duchesses, a haemophiliac heir, a mystical Rasputin, and all of these people who were annihilated. I saw them once. The eggs. I was a boy. My grandfather took me to your exhibition. Each one of these pieces ties back to an aristocracy, um, a religion, uh, a system of uh, governing that's, that's absolutely gone. And they're the only tangible evidence that these people ever lived. He was at Bloody Sunday. Your friend's Imperial Guard shot him. Right here. He was just an old man. I wish I'd smashed the eggs when I'd had the chance. So how had it all gone so horribly wrong for Fabergé and the aristocracy that adored him? And just what happened to the Fabergé eggs? The story begins in the same city where it ended, St. Petersburg. The Fabergé family originally came out from France they were refugees from the um, repeal of the Edict of Nantes. That's to say they were Huguenots, Protestants being persecuted by Louis XIV, and they fled eastwards from there. Carl Fabergé, known sometimes as Peter Carl because he was christened that, born in 1846, schooled in the German school in St. Petersburg. His father owned a small jewelry shop. It was a small jewelry shop, but in a smart area. His father clearly had an eye for Carl becoming something greater than just the jeweler he had been. Fabergé had such extraordinary talent uh, and his workshop was so extraordinary. The other thing is that he could be considered a foreign citizen. But being foreign in St. Petersburg was not at all unusual. It was a very, very uh, cosmopolitan city. He very much planned his education to give him an exposure to Western art, to some of the great jewelry treasures around Europe. The training that he uh, received when he was abroad with his family, studying the uh, collections of uh, museums in Paris and London, and returned to Russia and at the tender age of 26 takes over his father's firm. In Russia, at the end of the 19th century though, one had to get the attention of the Tsar to really make a name for yourself. And that was especially the case at the time of the autocratic Alexander III. Alexander III was so horrified by his own father, who was generally a liberal and a progressive, that he'd, he decided to reverse every reform. On the other hand, there was quite a lot to be said for Alexander III. He was almost the only Russian leader never to declare war on another country. He was also an extremely brave and powerful man. Perhaps his major mistake was not preparing his son, Nicholas II, uh, to rule. Carl Fabergé implemented a plan that would eventually catch the eye of this imperious Tsar. He started working on restoring ancient Scythian jewellery, which had recently been excavated from the Black Sea. He works on a volunteer basis at the Amitage, appraising and repairing uh, objects uh, without invoicing the court. And it all really paid off for him in 1882. There was an exhibition of Russian art at which Fabergé exhibited and what he was exhibiting was pieces derived from those Scythian artifacts. Uh, 
which appealed hugely to the Russian public because they gave the impression that Russia had this art-rich prehistory uh, to compete with anything in the West. That exhibition was visited by the Russian royal family and the Tsarina, Marie Fedorovna, bought the Tsar a pair of cufflinks from the Fabergé stand, uh, cufflinks with a cicada uh, motif. So that was the first uh, time he sold something to the Russian royal family. This brings him favor because in 1885, he's awarded the imperial warrant. Having been awarded the coveted imperial warrant, Carl Fabergé starts work on what would be the beginning of a long line of Easter gifts. The first hen egg. The first imperial egg was presented in 1885 by the Tsar, Alexander III, to his wife, Marie Fedorovna. It's a deceptively simple egg, and I think it's a great microcosm of what Fabergé does so well. It's um, white enamel on the outside, it's uh, gold uh, yolk on the inside represented, a chicken. You can open it up, inside it you find a golden yolk. You can open up the yolk, and inside that you find a golden hen. Inside was an imperial crown and a pendant. So it was, a, it was like it was like a matryoshka, you know, one of these Russian dolls. He was probably wanting so something to delight her, something to amuse her. What better way to celebrate 20 years of marriage and Easter in one, um, and led to a commission, an ongoing rolling commission that lasted uh, 33 years. Clearly that first egg worked, and each year the emperor would give the empress an Easter egg from Fabergé. Famously, Fabergé started to get total autonomy in the designs, and uh, with only three commands, that each gift should be egg-shaped, that each one should be different from any predecessor, and that each one should contain something of a surprise, something that would delight the empress. Carl Fabergé would quickly become a favorite of the Russian royal family. But neither they nor he saw the huge changes which were coming to the Russian Empire that would leave both Fabergé and his incredible imperial eggs in great peril. Towards the end of the 19th century, master jeweler Karl Fabergé had become a firm favorite of the Russian Tsar Alexander III and his wife, the Tsarina, Marie Fyodorovna. His one-of-a-kind imperial eggs had become a highlight of the Easter celebration. In 1890, he presented the exquisite Danish palace's egg, complete with a surprise of folding miniatures. This was followed by the memory of Azov egg, which commemorated a voyage taken by the future Tsar Nicholas II on the armored Russian cruiser, the Azov, where he narrowly survived an assassination attempt in Japan. The diamond trellis egg, made from pale jadeite, was presented in 1892, and was followed by the Caucasus egg of translucent ruby enamel in 1893. The Renaissance egg of 1894 would prove to be the last presented by Tsar Alexander III to his wife Marie. That same year, the Tsar suddenly fell ill with an incurable kidney disease, and he died at the age of only 49. The sudden death of the Tsar left his son, the terribly unprepared Nicholas II, to take the throne. And things got off to a dreadful start when at a celebration of his coronation at Kadinka Fields near Moscow, a stampede killed over 1,300 people. The public at large was not impressed with Nicholas's response to the tragedy. He was doomed after the Kadinka Fields catastrophe. He wasn't strong like his father. He wasn't expecting to be Tsar. He was only in his 20s. He had kept an iron grasp on the people. And then um, Nicholas comes along and he's a bit more diffident. To begin your coronation with a mass death of the population is bad. And then worse still, he should go to a ball at the French embassy on the same day of this disaster. So that, uh, in fact, did, did his prestige an enormous damage from which he never recovered. His strength and his weakness was that he was uh, slightly normal and he, he rather liked normal life. He liked chopping wood, being with his family, and uh, smoking, which he did a lot of the time. Fortunately for Fabergé, though, Nicholas continued the tradition of imperial Easter eggs. And in fact, two were now requested each year. One for Nicholas's mother, the now dowager empress, 
and one for the new Tsarina, Alexandra, who unfortunately was just as unpopular as the Tsar. Tsarina Alexandra came from the small German court of Darmstadt, and uh, she was known as the German one. That was a problem for her to get over to start with. Some Russian empresses have overcome this, but she was extremely tactless. She was convinced that uh, Russia should be an absolute monarchy, and she pushed her husband, and she had extremely bad judgment. She didn't enjoy balls and dances, uh, she thought that uh, the Russian aristocracy were, were very decadent. Meanwhile, the dowager had been very fun-loving. It was very popular. The, the Tsarina had a hard act to follow, and she didn't really manage. The first pair of eggs given was in 1895, when Tsarina Alexandra received the rosebud egg and the dowager received the blue serpent clock egg. This egg would eventually end up in Monaco, where it became a treasured possession of Princess Grace. Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip take the royal drive along the superb course. Princess Grace and Prince Rainier are guests. Three other eggs also ended up in royal possession, becoming the property of Queen Elizabeth II. The colonnade egg, the basket of flowers egg, and the stunning mosaic egg. It seems that Fabergé has always been a favorite of royalty right from the days of his very first royal client, the Dowager Empress Marie Fyodorovna. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. You look well, Master Jeweler. I persevere, Your Majesty. Yes. You are a wonderful reminder to the court that our generation is not past quite yet. We persevere indeed. I think Fabergé had an intimate relationship with virtually every member of the imperial family. Their relationships and their loves, their passions, their lusts and so on were expressed through the exchanges of these gifts. So all of the emotions which you know, are treasured in, in them as these historical figures coalesced into these Fabergé objects. On behalf of His Imperial Majesty, it is the great honour of the Carl Fabergé Company to present this year's Easter gift. Maria Fyodorovna was, unlike Nicholas II's wife, she had extraordinary charm. Once she was the Dowager Empress, she was the most respected member of the, of the royal family. The Dowager was generally more charming and outgoing than the Tsarina, and she had established a good relationship with Fabergé. He had obviously prepared the surprises very well. She'd always liked them. Marie Fedorovna, she was essentially the same age as him. She was his original client. She received those original eggs. And there are certainly letters from her, for example, to her sister, who is our own Queen Alexandra here in the UK, uh, in which she said, Fabergé brought the most wonderful egg. I told him you were a genius. Clearly, she liked him. I hope your majesty is pleased. My dear, dear Fabergé, you truly are an unparalleled genius. Fabergé's connection with the imperial family was the ultimate cachet, and his workshop was soon producing an array of items for other European aristocratic families. He even opened up an international store in London. That idea of a feudal society, if it was the fascination of the court, it quickly became the fascination of every level of society. The, the aristocracy, the, the traders, the bankers, the entrepreneurs, they would all want to participate in that royal fascination. And it wasn't just in Russia. In England, exactly the same thing happened. Fashions such as um, cigarette smoking came to the fore. Fabergé responded very quickly to this with cigarette cases. When you open this, you have not only the um, case itself and the characteristic um, thumb piece here, it opens to reveal a signature and a date. So this is when a cigarette case is not only a cigarette case, but it's a case that's been um, purchased uh, by a Grand Duchess as a gift. Fabergé is a Russian company and they were made in Russia and they are quintessentially Russian. It does have a distinct English flavour. And I think there is perhaps more Fabergé within a mile radius of where we're stood now than there is in the entirety of Russia and America put together. Essentially, uh, the London shop was started on the back of commissions or requests for objects from the British royal family. And the British royal family had learned to love Fabergé uh, because of the relationship between Marie Fedorovna and Alexandra. Edward VII and then Queen Alexandra, the sister of Maria Fedorovna, they were also fascinated by Fabergé, and as a consequence, English society became fascinated by Fabergé. There's a famous story of uh, 
I think he was by then Edward the Seventh, being given a present uh, by a friend, uh, saying, "Actually, I don't particularly want this. If you want to buy me something, go down to Fabergé's shop and look at it, look at what he's got." <laughs> Although the 50 imperial eggs are undoubtedly the most desired today, Fabergé did make other Easter eggs for paying customers, including the wealthy Kelch family. If you were a Russian lady of some stature, you would have chains of miniature Fabergé eggs, and then there were eggs in between that were given the size of hen's eggs, and there were various types, which are all marvellous, and they're all wonderful. The problem with making stuff for the Russian royal family was the bureaucracy he had to deal with. He did find it more congenial making objects for the newly emerging uh, middle classes, or very rich middle classes, I should say. Two very prominent European families who commissioned works from Fabergé were the Rothschilds and the Nobels, for whom the Nobel ice egg was made. They were happy to spend what it required, happy to give him carte blanche, and, and to take what he made for them, and he made some fabulous objects for them. Fabergé made two eggs every year during Nicholas II's reign, with the exceptions of 1904 and 1905, when no eggs were presented. During this period, Russia suffered a disastrous defeat in the Russo-Japanese War. 1905 was an especially bad year, with the Bloody Sunday Massacre being carried out in St. Petersburg and the eventually unsuccessful 1905 Revolution. Work on the eggs resumed in 1906 with the Swan Egg, with its automaton miniature. Carl Fabergé had brought his son Agathon into the company, which now had over 500 employees. Nephrite exterior, watercolour miniatures of the children. Father? You can do better. Russia was soon dragged in, and Tsar Nicholas II left the imperial court to take charge of the armed forces. In response, Karl Fabergé made what would turn out to be his last Easter gift, the steel military egg. Presented to the Tsarina Alexandra, it contained a surprise of her husband and son commanding the Russian army. But Nicholas II was never suited to being a military leader and Russia was grossly unprepared for the war effort. Once the Germans came to the help of the Austro-Hungarians and pushed the Russian army back, and the soldiers found they had to go into, uh, into battle with no boots, no rifle, and were told to take it off the first corpse they found, then the whole thing fell apart. Once housewives came out of their houses banging saucepans because there was no bread, then the Tsar had to go. The imperial family were offered uh, an exile in England, but all the children were ill. They all had measles. Um, and there was also the thought that the situation wasn't as grave as people were making out. So they delayed uh, their departure. George V, who was a cousin of the Tsar, took away his offer. It was considered safer to uh, take them to Siberia. However, the revolutionary Bolshevik forces led by Lenin managed to capture the Tsar, the Tsarina, and their children, and take them to the city of Ekaterinburg, where they came to a grisly end. Nikolai Alexandrovich, in view of your relative's continuing attacks on Soviet Russia, the Ural Executive Committee has ordered that you are to be executed. <laughs> the reason that they were executed was really because where they were kept in the Urals, the White Army was approaching, and the Reds feared, perhaps justifiably, if the Whites captured them again, they would have something to rally the country around once you got the Tsar back. And I think the panicky execution was uh, not due entirely to sheer brutality, but just to deny the, the, the opposition in the Civil War uh, as an important symbolic figure. There's a certain amount of obfuscation about it. I think because um, perhaps Lenin at various points thought it wouldn't be good for him to be named as the killer of the whole family. So there's also a dispute over who gave orders for the Tsar and Tsarina to be killed and who gave orders for the whole family to be killed. Lenin definitely sanctioned it. I mean, the brutality of the revolution, the Civil War, was so horrific that the deaths of the Tsars fit in with the deaths of millions of others who were, who were shot, tortured, drowned, and so on. 
The murder of the Russian royal family meant that Karl Fabergé's life was hanging in the balance and his amazing collection of works was in danger of being lost forever. Which makes the recent rediscovery of one of his imperial eggs all the more miraculous. In July 1918, the Russian royal family was executed and all their possessions seized by the new Soviet state. Karl Fabergé, very much a part of the now extinct Imperial Russia, was in danger of meeting a similar end. I saw them once. The eggs. I was a boy. My grandfather took me to your exhibition. I had pestered him about it for weeks. Did you have a favorite? In the early 1900s, he built a purpose-built headquarters in St. Petersburg with a shop on the ground floor, floors above that included uh, essentially workshops where a lot of the jewelry happened, although a lot, of, a lot of the other more specialist work would happen in other workshops outside. And then on floors above that, the design studio. One ruble, 10 kopecks it cost to get in. You wouldn't even bend down in the street to pick that up, would you? One ruble. I didn't know that was more than he made in a week. He was at Bloody Sunday. It's estimated that the Fabergé enterprise, well, he had workshops in St. Petersburg and in Moscow. Moscow was where they made silver. Uh, he had shops uh, in those two places, also Odessa, which was a popular tourist destination, and London, which dealt with most of his international business. Uh, and total employees either working for or indirectly for Fabergé, probably about 1,500 at its height. Your friend's Imperial Guard shot him. Right here. He was just an old man. I wish I'd smashed the eggs when I'd had the chance. They had a first stage of revolution, a parliamentary government, but it couldn't end the war and it couldn't continue the war. The officers wouldn't stop fighting, the soldiers wouldn't go and fight. And uh, finally, a small group of highly organized men, the Bolsheviks, uh, understood how to make a revolution. I wish many things were different. Comrade Lenin back in exile, you mean? Bloody Nicholas in his palace. They understood you don't have to have large numbers. You just take the railway junction and the telephone exchange. Once you hold those two, everyone else is paralyzed. Uh, so you could say it was Lenin's uh, and Trotsky's highly intelligent uh, methods uh, for a small group to take over a large country that, that uh, finished that stage of the revolution. You're all looters, war profiteers, parasites! Go in fat while the working man dies! But you don't make the world anymore. Famously, the Bolsheviks arrived at Fabergé's business uh, to take it over. He said, just give me a minute to fetch my hat and coat, and essentially slipped out the back. Uh, soon afterwards, he was uh, smuggled out of St. Petersburg. Uh, he ended up in Switzerland, uh, but he was clearly broken by the events of the revolution. He was not placed under arrest, nor was he dragged to Ekaterinburg and shot or any of his family members. So, um, his uh, destiny was very different. Um, his holdings were nationalized and eventually found his way to Lausanne, having traveled with his clothes and apparently a collection of wine, and died in Lausanne in 1920. Fabergé wasn't the only one who escaped, though. The Dowager Empress also managed to flee the revolution despite having been a Tsarina herself. She, along with other members of her family, were taken to safety aboard the British battleship HMS Marlborough. 
George V felt very guilty when he heard, obviously, this terrible tragedy. He made great efforts to get the Dowager out and the Tsar's sister, Ksenia, and all Ksenia's children. The local Reds never got round to executing members of the royal family. They were too much of a hurry defending themselves. And so she managed to get out on a British battleship. On the Marlborough, Prince Felix Yusupov, who murdered Rasputin, had two Rembrandts, and he was seen on deck with them rolled up under his arm. Uh, there was the Fabergé egg, the cross of St. George, down in the hold. And the Yusupovs also had other treasures, 20 million pounds worth of um, jewels and treasures on, on board, so quite an extraordinary amount. The cross of St. George egg was the last Fabergé egg presented to the Dowager Empress. By taking it with her, it became the only imperial Easter egg known to have left Russia with its owner. Karl Fabergé may have escaped to Switzerland, but his son Agathon, who'd become a key part of the Fabergé company, was not so lucky and remained in the now Soviet Russia. I think a lot of the enterprise and dealing within Fabergé's world was conducted by Agathon. And I think he did exactly the same after the revolution as he had done before. And he was a conduit himself for the movement of objects out of Russia to the West. And in fact, in Watsky's ledgers, there are um, references to us buying objects from Fabergé. And the Fabergé was Agathon Fabergé. Agathon Fabergé managed to escape Soviet Russia himself in 1927 but he had left behind one of the unfinished eggs due to be given to the Romanovs in 1917. It was found essentially in the Fersman Mineralogical Museum in Moscow. They thought it was a lampstand. It is actually an egg-shaped uh, bit of polished blue glass on a funny sort of cloud-shaped uh, bit of other glass. Uh, they now know, in fact, that that was going to be the egg for Alexandra Fedorovna. The story of the Blue Zarevich constellation egg reveals the precarious times that faced the imperial treasures after the Russian Revolution. Both Lenin and Stalin authorized the sale of many of Russia's greatest works of art to fund the Soviet programs. The revolution brought the Bolsheviks to power. Uh, even if there hadn't been economic collapse as well, it would have changed everything. Uh, economic collapse as well just made it all even worse. There was so much Russian art, and you could ar argue that in fact Russia had plundered all of Europe in the 18th century. Catherine the Great really got an enormous amount of, of stuff from impoverished English collectors and aristocrats. One of Lenin's famous commands was loot the looters. That is to say, all these people who have been uh, living uh, the life of Riley for the last uh, 50, 100, 300 years. Uh, it is now our turn to loot them. Despite the looting, the smashing, uh, the rotting away, uh, there's still uh, the Hermitage Gallery in St. Petersburg can only display a tiny fraction of what it has. Countless works of art were sold abroad, including the Fabergé eggs, and their buyers were a very mysterious bunch. They included Emanuel Snowman of Watsky and Arm and Hammer of Occidental Petroleum. Armand Hammer is a fascinating character, and he was almost the Joseph Devine of his day. Multi-millionaire capitalist who alleges that he is in fact a communist, um, <laughs> and then goes over and makes big deals uh, with, uh, with Lenin. He was not a communist, he was a capitalist through and through. He organized uh, trunk shows through uh, department stores uh, across America and catered to the way that women bought things and made uh, Fabergé pieces accessible to uh, the American public. Ultimately, he became the agent for the sale of Russian works of art, primarily, almost solely, to America. And so he was the conduit from Russia to America, whilst Emmanuel Snowman was a conduit from Russia to Western Europe. A king's ransom in art jewels, gems from the collection of the late Tsar of Russia on exhibition. Treasure worth many millions procured from the Soviet government after the revolution. Armand Hammer and Emmanuel Snowman were two of the major figures who had facilitated the movement of Fabergé eggs to the West. But one man who wanted to gather them for himself was Malcolm Forbes of Forbes magazine. He went on a spending spree. Malcolm Forbes was a relative latecomer, and Forbes was possessed by a collecting mania. He was an obsessive collector, I suppose. Um, the great thing about um, Fabergé eggs is there are only, well, 50 imperial ones and another uh, 16. So you could, you, you could actually get the lot. It was one of those things where you could find you had the complete stamp collection. In a span of two decades, Malcolm Forbes managed to get his hands on nine imperial Fabergé eggs in total. 
His ambition was always to have more Easter eggs than the Kremlin. He never quite got there, but he got very close. While most of the Imperial Fabergé eggs were sold abroad for foreign currency, 10 did remain in the Kremlin armory and have never left the country. And one of the great sort of stories and, and unknowns of these eggs is that we know exactly where they were in Soviet times, we know where they were in Imperial times, and we really know where they were once they'd emerged in the West. The skullduggery and the mischief of those original and first transactions, we don't know. And so I feel as though there are wonderfully sort of untold stories there involving these sort of ravenous dealers and sort of mischievous individuals. Malcolm Forbes' determination to collect as many Fabergé eggs as he could helped shoot up the price of these one-of-a-kind treasures. When the winter egg went on sale in 2002, it was bought by a Qatari bidder for $8.7 million. All done at $8,700,000. Maria, your bidder at 8 million. My favourite egg is one that was given to Marie Fedorovna in 1913. Uh, and that's one of the most striking things about it, is here we are, almost 30 years after that first egg, and you're still getting wonderful creativity. It looks like you're looking through a winter fog as you look through the egg. Uh, it's sitting on more carved rock crystal, which is polished so much that it looks like melting ice. And then within the egg, so you can see it through a winter fog, or open the egg and lift it out, is a little basket of enamel flowers of spring anemones. So you've got a wonderful symbolism there of spring seen through winter. In 2004, though, Malcolm Forbes' collection of Fabergé eggs would make their way back home to St. Petersburg when they were purchased by the Russian oligarch, Victor Vexelberg. Vexelberg, I think, spent something like $100 million getting uh, quite a large number of eggs back. They've gone back to the, um, the Fabergé Museum in St. Petersburg, which actually is a fabulous destination for them. Whatever the mechanism of why they got there, where they have ended up is the perfect home for them. For the longest time, 42 Imperial Fabergé eggs were known to have survived the Russian Revolution, with just eight remaining lost. But then, out of the blue, an American man arrived at Wartsky in London with evidence that one of those eggs had been found. Wartsky in London is forever entwined with the history of Fabergé, so it's the only place you would go if you thought you'd found a missing Imperial Fabergé egg. And that's exactly what an American individual recently did. In walked a gentleman, and he was the most unassuming, unprepossessing individual. He was wearing a plaid American shirt, the quintessential red plaid American shirt, jeans. He asked me by name, and when I came up, he couldn't actually speak to me. His mouth was dry with fear. There was a sort of like a, like a sort of inability to communicate. Just a couple of years before, a pair of intrepid researchers looked through a 1964 catalogue of the auctioneer's Parker Bonet now a part of Sotheby's. Within it, they discovered an image of the missing third Imperial Fabergé egg, which had been sold with everyone unaware of its true origin. The only other known image of this egg is from the 1902 Von Dervis Mansion exhibition, where many of the Fabergé eggs had been displayed. But this new discovery proved that the egg had made it to the West, and there was now a far clearer photograph of it. Kieran McCarthy of Wartsky was part of an article published by the Daily Telegraph on this catalogue discovery, which gave some hope that the egg may turn up someday, now that it was proved to have survived the Russian Revolution. But little did he know how quickly that article would lead him to the egg itself. I went out to America as pretty much as quickly as my feet and the wings would carry me afterwards. We travelled a long way to a very remote part, and I walked into the kitchen of this house, which is a million miles from Imperial St. Petersburg, and sat on a kitchen counter. There was um, a cupcake, and next to it, the, uh, the missing Easter egg. A Google search had proved key in bringing owner and expert together. He had no idea whatsoever that it was Fabergé. He had no concept that this was a missing imperial egg. And so he typed into Google, of all things. He typed Vacheron Constantin and egg. What came up was all of the art historical research which I and Wartsky had been involved in surrounding this egg. And so although the miracle of him walking through our door one day it was a miracle, the actual link and the reason why he walked through our door was that research. It proves that these eggs are out there to find. You know, there were 50 eggs. Some of them were 
destroyed or uh, melted down or disappeared. And uh, we had thought that uh, eight were missing and until recently uh, that was the case. And then this, this, this third egg um, appeared. Well, the egg displays every wonder of Fabergé's work. The first is, it's a very simple construction. It's a, a reeded gold egg. But the simplicity belies how difficult it is to make. Each one of these reeds is formed by hand by a craftsman at a workbench. They taper at the same rate to an exact point, both at the bottom and at the top. And when you press the diamond at the front, it opens to reveal the watch by Vacher and Constantin. And this scrolling around the bezel of the aperture where it's there is found on many of them. It's the identical engravings on the cradle with garlands egg. And so you begin to see these little sort of hints of what Fabergé has done before and of how Fabergé's craftsmen worked. And another aspect is when you flip the watch up, it sits which is a beautiful little piece of design which actually allows it to work as not just an Easter egg, but as a clock. And where you really see the absolute tour de force of goldsmithing is not so much in the simple egg, but in the far more elaborate stand. Four coloured gold roses, and roses are an emblem of love. And so the Tsar and the Tsarina, when they saw this, would know that it was an expression of love. And then the lion paw feet, they're beautifully finished on top and they are slightly stylized, but very sort of endearing lion's paws. But when you turn it over and look at the base, the pads and the underside of the feet are as beautifully represented. And of course, the Tsarina would never have seen that because it would have sat like that. This is one of the most sophisticated pieces of goldsmithing if from Fabergé's or anybody else's hands that has ever been created, and it would have been a gift appropriate for us all. But what of the seven imperial Fabergé eggs that are still missing? Well, one of them is called the Cherub with Chariot Egg, and it could be seen in the same photograph from the 1902 Von Dervis exhibition that featured the third imperial egg. Sitting sneakily behind the Caucasus egg, you can see the wheel of the cherub with chariot egg and can catch a glimpse of it in the reflection of the glass casing. This artist's interpretation shows what the egg could look like if you happen to notice another 20 million pound treasure at an antique store. But this isn't the only Fabergé egg of which we have but a faint glimpse. The fifth egg in the series is known as the Nécessaire egg and it featured at a 1949 exhibition of Fabergé eggs in London. London and a Regent Street jeweller has become the setting for an exhibition of the work of Karl Fabergé, that great craftsman of Tsarist Russia. His son, Eugène Fabergé, holds one of the jewel-studded enamel and gold Easter eggs made for the last empress as a gift from the Tsar. Kieran McCarthy, who was instrumental in finding the third Fabergé egg, has also brought us closer to uncovering this one when he found an image of it in the back of a photograph taken at the exhibition. That's one of the most frustrating sort of events in my life. Worski is an Edwardian company, and our ledgers are arranged that on the left-hand side it shows what the object is. And I looked across where we have the name of the buyer, the address of the buyer, and how much they paid. So I thought, if Mr. Bloggs lives at Four Bloggs Square, I can go and knock on Four Bloggs Square and find the egg within. But I look across, and it said, a stranger. And, uh, and Wartsky's discretion, as it is with this egg, we cannot reveal who bought or sold this egg. And there is no way of telling where it went. The exquisite work of the man who was court jeweler and goldsmith to Russia's royal house still mirrors the splendor of an age that is no more. Although the Nécessaire egg featured at this exhibition, it was not known at the time to be the fifth imperial Easter egg. The Nécessaire egg was never recognized as an imperial Fabergé egg, but importantly, it was recognized as a Fabergé egg. So this egg here was never known to be Fabergé, and so because of that, it was never likely to be saved because it was Fabergé, and as a result, this danced on the precipice of the melting pot over and over again. It was sold to almost certainly an English customer, and it was only in 1952, so it is likely to have survived, and that one, I, I feel in my instinct, has survived. Of the five eggs where, where we've got no trace of them coming to the West, it's possible that they'll emerge one day. It's equally possible that they were destroyed in the whole chaos around the revolution. Despite the slim chances of discovery, there are photos of two of these five most elusive Fabergé eggs. The 1909 Alexander III commemorative egg and the 1903 Royal Danish egg. 
Oddly, we also have the surprise of the 1897 mauve egg, but not the egg itself. The missing royal Danish egg is the intriguing one, though, as it was presented to the Dowager Empress whilst she was away at her original home of Copenhagen in 1903. It's not known for sure if she ever brought the egg back to Russia, so it may be the case that something is amiss in the state of Denmark. You just never know, and, that, and that's partly the mystery of them. And I think that's why this one, this particular egg, is so significant, because it is one of the missing ones. Well, it seems possible that it might be there. Um, she, she wasn't very keen to pass anything on when she was alive, and she used to say, you can have my treasure when I'm dead. So, uh, yeah, it could be, yes. When you know the history, it becomes rather blasé. You know, oh, I know that one, I've seen it there, it was exhibited there, and it went there, and they paid so much, and they did this. It's the ones you don't know about that actually excite the, um, the mind and the fascination. All seven of the missing eggs are ones that were presented to the Dowager Empress Marie Fyodorovna. It's known that she escaped Russia on the HMS Marlborough with the Cross of St. George egg on board. The Dowager took the egg with her, presumably to England. I think uh, then Xenia, her daughter, then Vasily, her youngest son, ended up with it, and then he sold it. But there's no reason why this should have been the only egg she took with her. It's possible she packed up the Empire Nephrite egg and mauve egg, or any other of the missing ones, such as the second hen egg with sapphire pendant. These are the only three eggs left, of which we have no images. But that doesn't mean they're not out there. It's like James Dean. It's like, you know, if, if, they, if Fabergé carried on and we were now on the 1042nd Fabergé egg, I think they would not have the same appeal. But the fact that it's finite, the, the glory of Fabergé is that it is no more. The reason we've all heard of Fabergé today is because of the eggs. These great, fabulous objects that he started to make for the Russian royal family. They are just so over the top, so wonderful, so inspired in their creativity as well. They're just wonderful objects uh, for combining history and craftsmanship. The extraordinary about Fabergé is the very, very expensive materials used, unique jewels. The, the materials themselves are a wealth beyond imagination. Then the extraordinary craftsmanship, the miniaturization of the work. It's an oriental type of work. It's very, very Iranian, Indian uh, in, in its use of jewelry, its intricacy. Fabergé eggs sort of encapsulate the romance of the, of the story. So much um, care gone into them. They're a product of the social, cultural, financial, political circumstances of that moment. And it's that collision of great craftsmanship and uncompromising patronage that gives rise to this fascination with Fabergé. On 25th of January, 1891, Theo van Gogh died at the age of 33. Just six months earlier, his brother, Vincent van Gogh, had also died, leaving behind an astonishing collection of artworks that were almost completely unknown. With the death of Theo, Vincent's closest confidant and most ardent supporter, the van Gogh artistic legacy hung in the balance and the responsibility fell on the shoulders of Joanna Bonga, Teo's widow. This was a great act of faith. She may only have met this very difficult person, her husband's brother, two or three times in her life, and yet she determined to keep together this legacy of painting. She did it with great tenacity, and also found a uh, skill with lending pictures, allowing pictures to be bought, so that slowly and then increasingly quickly, the fame of Vincent began to spread. Without Joanna Bonga, Vincent van Gogh may have been completely lost to the world. In the decades that followed, van Gogh's works have been on a truly remarkable journey. They inspired an entire artistic movement. They fell victim to the trials of World War II. 
they have been the target of greedy forgers and daring thieves. At $22 million. And their value has skyrocketed from the day they first caught the world's attention. The man himself also became a legendary figure thanks to the publication of the letters between Vincent and Teo. And the story is still being told. A long-lost masterpiece by Vincent van Gogh was only revealed in 2013. I think Van Gogh will always have huge commercial value because of the myth of the man. He really is this character that everyone is fascinated by. She sold more than 250 works of art. We are sitting here having this conversation because that's why Van Gogh has grown so famous. She spread him over the world. We have glimpses of his other lost paintings, some of which could still be out there. Joanna Bonga had only been married to Theo van Gogh for two years when he died. With his passing, she had inherited almost all of Vincent's works. But as a young widow with a newborn son to care for, she was in a very precarious position. She had the assistance of her art-loving brother, Andreas, but even he didn't appreciate her new collection of masterpieces. You could have your own room at home. The mother could help with the boy. What will you do for money? Joanna was a middle-class Dutch girl, sister of a friend of a Dutchman living in Paris who was in the Van Gogh brothers' circle. She was a very educated woman. She worked as a translator in the library of the British Museum. I think it was a mixture of, of sort of Dutch steeliness and Victorian sentimentality. She doesn't seem to have been tremendously interested in art before she was pulled into this circle of avant-garde art. In the very first letter, Theo wrote to Jo, and Vincent was in the hospital in Arl. He wrote, we must keep the memory of my brother together, don't you think? Shan't we, darling? He says. So before being married, she knew that she was part of the game. I'll teach again, take lodgers. I'm not going back. Besides, Mother doesn't have room for all the paintings. Nobody would think any less of you for selling. She seems to me to have been a rather serious-minded intellectual young woman who took her responsibilities seriously and who really took on this project of uh, uh, posthumously serving the reputation of Vincent van Gogh. She was the person who championed van Gogh after his death. I think she really saw herself as taking over the mantle from Theo, who was his main support, both commercially and emotionally. And she knew how important it was to him to really launch the career of Vincent. Why don't we try to find a buyer for you here? I could ask in my office, if you'd like. The insurance brokers. Well, it wouldn't be much, obviously. No. They don't approve of bohemian art, do they? Well, it's better than nothing. Joanna Bonga's brother, Andreas, who had known Vincent van Gogh, would eventually assist in Joanna's quest. But at one point, it's believed he proposed a horrifying solution to his sister's storage problem. You know, they may not be painters, Joe but they're perfectly decent people. It isn't boring to work hard or provide for oneself. Not everybody's brother is so easy to take advantage of. Well, it's said that Andreas Bongo wanted to destroy the paintings after Vincent's death. It does seem strange afterwards, and it does seem slightly out of character. So it may have been something he did, or he thought of at one point very quickly. There still weren't very many sales, there still wasn't very much of a reputation, so uh, it would be an entirely rational thing to do, not to, not to hang on to all this junk. I'm, I'm sorry. Theo loved Vincent. I know. He was happy to help. And Vincent did work hard. He made himself sick, he worked so hard. I'm sorry. She was fiercely protective of his art. She really saw um, herself as carrying on Theo's legacy making sure that Vincent became known and got what he deserved, really, as an artist. 
She apparently decided that what she, what she ought to do is devote herself to as, as, as becoming a sort of curator of this collection. I'd like you to leave. But I only want what's best for you and the boy. You won't get a better price in Amsterdam. Get out! Vincent was a genius. Theo knew. I'm not selling. But how did Joanna Bonga become a curator for an almost unknown artist? Her discovery of the letters written between the brothers would prove key in telling the lost story of Vincent van Gogh's life, as would his reputation amongst other avant-garde artists who also struggled for recognition of their work. of artworks by her troubled brother-in-law, Vincent van Gogh. There were no obvious buyers for the paintings, as Vincent is only thought to have sold one picture during his lifetime. The Red Vineyard was purchased by the neo-impressionist painter Anna Bock. Vincent may not have had any real commercial success, but he was very appreciated by the other avant-garde artists of his era. This reputation he developed would prove a starting point for Joanna's quest. As would her discovery of the letters that Theo and Vincent wrote to each other that brought Vincent's story to life. She found them in a kind of bottom drawer. They were living in Pigalle at the time, her and Theo. And of course, she, poor woman, was widowed very young, and she was left with nothing except 200 Van Goghs. She said, every, every week I saw the yellow envelopes coming in, and Theo put it in the cupboards, and, and she got letters too from Vincent. But she said, I only want to publish the letters after his work will be known. So she waited and she did it on purpose. And I have a very strong idea that she waited until the mother of Vincent and Theo died. So it was not, a, not too complicated for this old mother. I think there's something like 700 between the two boys. Most of them are from Vincent because he threw Theo's away. The great one where he says, I'm going to sign my picture as Vincent because the French can't pronounce Van Gogh. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. They're wonderful letters. She was so aware that when she married Theo, she got Vincent too. That was part of it. Vincent had lived in Paris with his brother Theo from 1886 to 1888, when the city was still enthralled by the work of Impressionist painters. And Vincent had begun to ever so slightly make his mark on the art world. As soon as he arrived in Paris, and thanks to uh, Theo in part, he did meet all of the avant-garde artists. And in fact, before he left for, uh, for Arles in the south, the last artist he went to see was Georges Seurat. And we know that Gauguin was coming to admire him, but it remained a very uh, marginal kind of uh, enthusiasm. Another of the great artists of the era who admired him was Toulouse-Lautrec. He even made a pastel sketch of his friend Vincent in 1887. He'd spent uh, two years living in Paris. Almost everything we know about Van Gogh's life comes from his letters, and that was the one time when he was living, he was actually sharing a flat most of the time with his brother Theo, so there was no need for him to write. So there are very, very few letters from those two years. Although the exact details may not be known, what is for sure is that it was in Paris that Vincent's style of painting changed dramatically. He'd been influenced by the Impressionists of the era, but also by Japanese art. He was ahead of his time, though many of the tendencies in terms of very bright color, in terms of decorative patterning, in terms of um, self-expression in the way he did it, were coming to be valued in the avant-garde. But before he could make any real name for himself in the world artistic capital of Paris, Van Gogh moved to Arles in the south of France in 1888. We sometimes think of him as an isolated figure, um, working away in the south of France with little contact with other artists. But in fact, when he was in Paris, he was right in the heart of things. And actually one of the reasons he left Paris was he found it too exhausting. 
It was in Arles that he created his best-known works, including the sunflowers. His most commercially successful work now was made really in the last part of his life. I mean, when he died, a lot of the paint wouldn't have been dry on the sunflowers, in that thick and pasto paint would still be wet. So there really wasn't much of a chance for him to be promoting his work. And I don't think he was that kind of person. He wanted to be in the South, just working frenetically as he did. The pictures that we see as attractive and full of life and bubbling with um, enthusiasm at the time uh, were rejected and seen as just too avant-garde. 20 or 30 years later, things that he had intuited about fragmentation. So if you look at the surface of Van Gogh, it's very clearly made up of, of fragmentary brush strokes. And there, there are all sorts of fallings apart going on, including mental ones. That would have been very unfashionable in the 1880s. People wanted synthesis. I think people relate to it now just because it's highly emotive. It's subject matter which is, feels its nature, its portraits, but in the colours and the marks and the vibrancy of it, it's almost mythic. By sort of 40 years later and after the First World War, people were aware of a world that was fragile and they found that in Van Gogh's paintings, you know, sort of strident, anxious colours and uh, flickering brushwork. Had he lived uh, another few decades, um, I suspect he would have become very marketable, but he died just too soon. It did then take uh, a few generations for a wider public to appreciate those values. Whilst in the south of France, Van Gogh had stayed in touch with two other struggling artists of the era, Emile Bernard and Paul Gauguin. In his letters to them, he even included sketches of the paintings he was creating in Arles. It's one of the things that's given Van Gogh such a fame because the letters give a marvelous insight into his art. Van Gogh, Gauguin and Bernard had also remained in contact by painting self-portraits and sending them to each other with the other member of the trio in the background. If you look at the museum, you see some paintings by Gauguin and by Bernard. Why are they there? Because the, they were exchanged. As he had done for most of his adult life, Van Gogh wrote many letters to Theo during his time in Arles. My dear Theo, many thanks for the canvas you sent. Now we can join battle once more. My dear Vincent, your new consignment arrived yesterday evening. The painting is truly remarkable. I have rented a room in Montmartre, which you'd like. It is small, but overlooks a little garden full of ivy. Jo sends her warm regards and a smile from the little one. I remember you insisted a great deal on me getting married. You were right. Van Gogh's attempt to start an artistic community in the south of France did not end well, though. He had checked himself into the asylum at Saint-Rémy, where he painted many more of his best-known works. I do so wish you would tell me how you feel. Nothing is more distressing than uncertainty. I don't say that my work is good, but rather it is the least bad that I can do. Every day I wish for your speedy recovery. There is one very important moment when Vincent sliced part of his ear and had to go to the hospital in Arles. And then there's a letter of Mother Van Gogh to Theo, and she says, how beautiful, two heads on one cushion. So it means that in the hospital, the two brothers were on the same bed and talked things over, just like they did when they were very young. And I think that's a very moving moment in realizing how close this relation was. All your kindness to me, dear brother. I've felt it more than ever today. Don't bother your head about me or about us, old chap. I am beginning to consider madness an illness like any other, and we all must accept the illnesses of our time. Do not despair. Sooner or later, we each have our share. Better days will come. Write to me, dear brother. Ever yours, your loving Vincent. Your loving Theo. Vincent van Gogh would eventually return to Paris in 1890, where Theo and Joanna had recently had a son. 
also called Vincent. Vincent and Joanna's uh, relationship was uh, vestigial as, as far as uh, actual person-to-person -person, uh, meeting is concerned. She saw him when he arrived in Paris in May 1890, and there was a, another visit to Auvers while Vincent was living in a little village north of Paris. She says, and I thought I would meet a, a boy that was very struck by all these diseases, but he was well formed and he was at broad shoulders. I was surprised that he was so alive and so well aware of his, of his position. And then they visited him in uh, Auvers-sur-Oise, 30 kilometers north of, of Paris. And they had a good time th that day and they uh, had lunch together and uh, he played with the little Vincent. Everything else Joanna found out about Vincent, she would either have heard from Theo uh, learnt from reading the letters or learnt after Vincent's death, which makes it all the more remarkable that she devoted most of the rest of her life to uh, Vincent's reputation and achievements as an artist. Vincent would not last long in Auvers-sur-Oise. He continued painting right until the very end, though, making some of his most experimental works, including a piece called Tree Roots which is believed by some to be his last ever painting. He would die on July the 29th, 1890, of a gunshot wound. She had a little feeling of guilt after Vincent died, and she said, but we didn't say anything wrong, did we? No, we did, Theo said. It was not our fault. It was in his head, and we did not cause it. Theo van Gogh would also be dead within six months. It must have been incredibly stressful for Theo, being the, his benefactor, making sure that he was funded, also being his pretty much sole confidant to all of the highs and lows of Vincent's work and mental state. Of course he was heartbroken and he, was, he had lots of grief and it was very hard for him and he was sad and he was everything. But still, he had a second stage of syphilis too. No doubt, the emotional shock of losing his brother, who he'd been so close to, um, must have also exacerbated his condition. Within a few months, he went totally mad. And if you want to have uh, an uncomfortable night, read the report of the, uh, the doctor, of Theo, because it was a very hard, very hard time for him. Following the death of her husband and brother-in-law, Joanna had to make use of the limited reputation Vincent had built up amongst his fellow artists. Following the death of Theo and Vincent, Johanna really rallied to make sure that his art became known. And her house became a sort of hub for people interested in Van Gogh, and she really, really pushed him. It didn't take her long. Soon, Claude Monet came to see Van Gogh's works and announced his surprise that a man who loved flowers and light so much could have been so unhappy. Another giant of the time, Camille Pizarro, also showed his appreciation, declaring that Vincent's flowers look like people. There were some young artists, and they helped her with the first exhibitions here in Amsterdam in 1892, and she did it very well. She did essentially, I think, three things. She published the letters bit by bit. She lent pictures to international exhibitions, of which there were a sequence so that people saw Van Gogh's work. And a certain amount of it was sold. These early sales were made to some of the most influential and wealthy people of the era. The major galleries would quickly follow behind them in trying to purchase works. And it's during this time that many of the mysteries of what happened to Van Gogh's paintings started to form. Some items would sadly be lost forever. Some are still missing, and one has been sitting unappreciated in an attic for decades. Joanna Bonga wasted no time in presenting the works of her brother-in-law, Vincent Van Gogh, to the world. She arranged numerous exhibitions and loaned the paintings to various galleries. And it wasn't long before buyers soon came knocking on her door. Joanna had works from the entirety of Vincent's career, but it was the sunflower paintings that would unsurprisingly prove the most popular. 
Possibly the very first buyer of Vincent van Gogh's work after he died was the celebrated French writer Octave Mirbeau. In 1891, he purchased both the Iris's painting and the Three Sunflowers painting for a mere 600 francs. In 1894, Emile Schuffernecker, an avant-garde artist himself, started collecting Van Gogh's when he purchased one of the series of sunflowers. Amazingly, he chose to alter the picture by stretching out the canvas on all sides and painting in the gaps himself. Hugo von Schudi, the director of the National Gallery in Berlin, was also taken by the sunflowers buying one of the series for himself in 1905. The painting has remained in Germany ever since. But it was in 1908 that the most determined collector emerged. That year, Helena Kroller Muller first acquired this early painting by Van Gogh, titled Edge of a Wood, and it would begin a long love affair with the artist. Helena Kroller Muller was a very, very wealthy person one of the wealthiest persons in Holland at the time. When Helena went to Paris, she did not buy little bags, but she did buy Van Gogh's. Just having them five at a time or 10 at a time. She mostly, but her husband also was buying. In the beginning, she started buying one and one, and then they went to Paris to, to auctions, uh, visiting artist studios. Uh, and there is one weekend she bought five Van Gogh's. Together, the Kroller Mullers managed to purchase 91 Van Goghs, making it the second largest collection in the world, and eventually the centerpiece of the Kroller Muller Museum. It was very obvious that in the Netherlands, she was the wealthiest collectioner at that moment. For her, Van Gogh was the greatest artist that there had been, and he was sort of the start of modern art. And she was also very interested in him because he was, was painting and drawing social themes, and she was a very social conscious person, so that attracted her too. Helena Kroller Muller's support played a key role in developing Van Gogh's legacy. But surprisingly, she had no contact with Joanna Bonga and bought her paintings from the first dealers in Van Gogh's works. That's quite surprising because Jo had the paintings, and if you see with a kind of U-turn what went from Jo to Helena Kulamillo that had everything to do with the fact that Helena Kulamillo was a very, very wealthy person. And Jo was a very convinced social democrat. And I think the, the characters of the ladies were not that close to each other. She was also playing a very important role in that because she showed her own collection. She gave them a loan to other exhibitions, both nationally as internationally. And Jo Bonger also gave her a collection. They both were very important in making him so famous and so well-known. Joanna Bonga would marry again in 1901. Her new husband, Johann Cohen Gosschalk, was also an artist and painted portraits of her. But she would be left widowed again in 1912. She went to live in New York City soon after World War I broke out, and it was during this terrifying time that she first published the letters of Vincent and Theo. They sold very well. It was during the First World War, and people think that's a wrong moment to publish letters like that. But on the contrary, during wartime, people are more attached to literature or to very important things that were happening in the past. After World War I, Joanna returned to the Netherlands, where she continued to work on building Vincent's legacy. She loaned out the sunflowers to another artist called Isaac Israels, who used them as the backgrounds for his paintings. Israels also painted portraits of Joanna, with whom he had once had a brief relationship. Isaac already knew Theo when he lived in Paris and visited him there. And he was a well-known painter here. He did a lot of impressionist things in cities, very well-known in Amsterdam. Jo and he met each other, and they liked each other very well. They liked each other very, very well. Uh, we have the diaries of Jo still, and uh, there is a line, and she says, I was at the studio of Isaac Israels. We played with fire. And then two lines are cut out. Um, very interesting. And I think the only one who could have done this was her son, Vincent.
The series of sunflowers paintings had become Van Gogh's most recognized work, thanks to Joanna's efforts. In 1924, Jim Eade, the curator of the National Gallery in London, made it his mission to purchase one of the sunflowers. But it wouldn't be easy to convince Joanna to part with her personal favorite. Would you care for some tea? Yes. He had begun to paint sunflowers in Paris. Already, Paul Gauguin had told him this was a great subject for him, had told him that these were marvelous. He repeatedly said how tremendous he thought the sunflower paintings were and tried to get Van Gogh to give him one of them as well. So Vincent and Gauguin both thought that these were important pictures. We know from a quote from Vincent Van Gogh that he really saw the sunflower as his own symbol. There's something about them that grabs people. I mean, the color of the yellow on yellow is a, a dramatic and interesting way of presenting it. It's so become an iconic that one just associates sunflowers, almost the flowers, with Van Gogh. To paint a picture which was effectively all in modulations of one color would have seemed tremendously radical, or indeed, to some relatively avant-garde artists who saw it early on, completely insane. I cannot express how honored we would be. The Sunflowers truly is a masterpiece. We acquired this in 1924 when we received uh, money from Samuel Courtauld, the industrialist, specifically to buy modern paintings for the National Gallery. And right then, Van Gogh was right at the top of the list of modern artists whom we wanted to represent here. It was very keen to buy a Van Gogh and really wanted the sunflowers. And they pleaded with the Ohana to sell the sunflowers to the National Gallery. We would take the greatest of care. There's a couple of letters from her which are very moving. She says that she's seen the painting every day during her life or her adult life, and she didn't want to part with it. She knew that it was important and she wanted to hang on to it. I think she had a connection with it and knew that Theo did too and wanted to keep it. It's not for sale. I understand. Jim Eade at that point was one of the few people in Britain who really knew about uh, modern art uh, and could speak authoritatively. Uh, what he said to Johanna Bonger, in my understanding, was that we are the National Gallery. If this artist is to re be represented here, we really need a picture of the highest achievement. Jim Eade's persistence would eventually prove worthwhile in the end. A few days later, she sent a, another letter to the director of the National Gallery saying that she would reluctantly sell it for the sake of Vincent's glory uh, because she wanted him to be represented in such an important gallery. Dear Mr. Eade, I have tried to harden my heart against your appeal. I have looked on that picture every day for 30 years. I could not bear to part with it. It was really the kudos and importance of that gallery that made her think, this is really going to set in stone uh, Vincent as a titan of the 20th century. I have come to realize that no other picture could represent Vincent in a more worthy manner. He would have wanted it to be there in your gallery. It's interesting that Van Gogh actually had lived in London earlier in his life uh, when he worked as an art dealer in his, in his early 20s and he loved going to the National Gallery. So it's very nice that his sunflowers have ended up there. She also would have known that he was a great admirer of certain aspects of British art and British literature, the moralizing uh, side of it, that art was about something, that it taught you things. It is a sacrifice I must make for his glory. 
With Van Gogh's work now in the National Gallery, Joanna's mission could be declared a complete success, as Vincent had been accepted as a truly great artist. She would die just a year after the painting was sold. But what of the huge number of Van Goghs that Joanna still had in her possession? They would eventually become the very foundation of the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam when it opened in 1973. But in the intervening decades, many works by Vincent had gone missing due to the chaos of World War II and a collection of mysterious owners and devious forgers. The struggle to get them all back continues. Joanna Bonga, the guardian of Vincent van Gogh's legacy, died on September the 2nd, 1925, soon after selling the painting of 15 sunflowers to the National Gallery in London. Before she passed away, though, Van Gogh had already inspired a whole new generation of artists, especially in Germany. It truly was Germany that first embraced him as a great artist. And if, if we look at the art that emerged in Germany uh, in the decades following, it is as if they'd been waiting for someone who would show them how to paint with this intense expressivity and with this extraordinary sense of color. Van Gogh had in fact been so lauded in Germany that fakes of the artists first started to emerge here. The major incident was in the 1920s when a Berlin gallery owner, Otto Wacker, faked dozens of Van Gogh paintings, which were initially accepted by the experts, and then they realized they were wrong, and he was found guilty. And since then, there has been a continual problem of faking. A number of Van Goghs have been deattributed, even those of which belong to museums. Um, so it continues to be highly controversial. The fear of fakes continues to the present day. One of the Sunflowers paintings once owned by Emil Schuffenecker was sold for a record 22.5 million pounds in 1987. It was known that the picture had been extended around the edges, but some at the time claimed that the whole painting was a copy done by Schuffenecker. However, this claim was later confirmed to be untrue. The problem of fakery has also dogged another work by Vincent van Gogh for nearly its entire existence. But in 2013, the Van Gogh Museum was able to present a newly rediscovered painting for the first time in many decades. The Sunset and Mont Majeur. It is a great pleasure for us to present to you this morning a new work by Vincent van Gogh. That painting was one of the paintings that was owned by Theo van Gogh and passed into the hands of Johanna. And it was first sold in 1901. And then it went through a period until 1908 where we don't know the provenance. And then it went into the collection of a Norwegian businessman. Quite soon after he bought it, he was told it was a fake. So he just put it up in his attic. And there it stayed with his family. And then about 20 years ago, it was sent to the Van Gogh Museum and to ask what it, whether it might be authentic. And at that point, it was rejected and the museum said it was not right. And then in 2011, research was launched again. And they looked at the paint technique, the type of paint really under the microscope. They used a letter from July 1888 when it was painted from Vincent Tuteo, which described a very similar scene of this abbey um, painted from the scrub lamp below. There were two key points. One was it had a number chalked on the back, which uh, turned out to be an inventory number from Andreas Bonga. So we could link it up with an 1890 inventory. And the other thing which was surprising was missed by the Van Gogh Museum the first time is that it shows the castle of Mont Majeur in the south of France, which had a very unusual tower. Uh, and that helped to identify it. There is a kind of rule in art history that when a, a, a picture disappears off the, the, the beaten track, when it goes to a place like Norway, um, where it's not seen by a lot of people, then it becomes, the assumption arises, oh, it can't be right. Uh, and it falls out of, uh, out of favor. The discovery of this new work gives us hope that other missing Van Goghs may be found one day. Many of them vanished during World War II, 
There are probably roughly 10 Van Gogh paintings which disappeared during the Second World War. There were a few that were probably burnt and destroyed, including a very important self-portrait. Uh, there were some that were looted or, or stolen and have not turned up. One of the lost Van Goghs which I personally would most like to see is the, is the picture of the painter on the road to Tarascon. That is a picture of Van Gogh himself walking along the road which led past his yellow house out into the fields. This one disappeared during the Second World War. It was probably destroyed in a fire. The chances, unfortunately, are rather small that it survived. There are others which one day we may see again. There's an important flower still life, uh, which um, was stolen during the wars, and has not turned up. I mean, it might one day, who knows? There is an extraordinary photograph of Hermann Goering sort of caressing in a creepy way this very important late Van Gogh from the Over period called A Tree with Ivy, a painting which possibly Goering then uh, appropriated. It's a, a lot of pictures in Paris were disappearing into collections of prominent uh, Nazi officials. It seems Goering had a taste for contemporary art as well as Renaissance art and Baroque art, but if he did, uh, it wasn't. It didn't remain with the main collection of Goering's work, which was then recovered. Maybe it's in a bank vault somewhere still, one can hope. There are a tantalizing number of lost Van Goghs, which it would be uh, wonderful to see again, and also destroyed Van Goghs. Uh, amongst the latter, one of the most poignant is the sunflower painting. This one was bought by a Japanese collector in 1920. It was actually the first Van Gogh to go to Japan, which is interesting. It was in a private collection and it was uh, destroyed on the 6th of August, 1945, the very same day as the first atomic uh, bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. So this was on a separate bombing raid in Tokyo itself. It's a very interesting coincidence. It tells us a lot. Uh, about how, the different ways he was thinking about sunflowers at that moment, because it doesn't resemble uh, our picture uh, at all. So clearly he was working out a lot of possibilities in his mind. We had a rather poor um, photographic reproduction of the painting, but what I found was a very early 1920s colour reproduction in a portfolio published in Japan, which had not been known about to Van Gogh specialists. And this had much more natural colours, so it gave us an idea of what the picture looks like. And even more interestingly, um, this reproduction has an orange frame around the painting, an orange strip of wood. And if you look at Van Gogh's letters, he describes how he wanted to present the blue sunflowers against an orange frame. So for the first time, we can see how Van Gogh wanted to present the picture. Some of the others which have disappeared, we, one might entertain hopes that one day they will reappear. While the search for lost Van Goghs continues, the story of Vincent's life has become world famous. After the publication of the letters, the writer Irving Stone released the wildly successful novel Lust for Life in 1934, which told the story of Vincent Van Gogh's many hardships. What do you know about pain? It would be made into a film starring Kirk Douglas 20 years later. Let me talk to Kay for as long as I can keep my hand in this frame. Vincent! The movie captured what had become one of the most legendary times in Van Gogh's life when he was staying in Arles with Paul Gauguin, another artist who was largely unappreciated during his lifetime. I've dug ditches in the stinking heat of the tropics. I worked in the docks and weather so cold my hands froze to the ropes. And I can tell you there's nothing noble or beautiful about it. I did it so I could go on painting. I didn't have a brother to support me. There was already a sort of bit of a myth of the man around Gauguin. He had been a stockbroker and he left his wife and he was really sort of a character within those circles. And Vincent, I think, really looked up to him, saw him as this pioneer of an emotive form of art full of synesthesia and using paint to conjure different ways of thinking and set the senses. He was just on the edge of, of having a breakdown when Gauguin arrived. Gauguin actually mentions this in his own letter to, to, to Theo. Um, and then Van Gogh actually gets better for a couple of months. I think he paints something like 25 pictures in five months, and he's just painting and painting and painting. Not necessarily the happiest period in his entire life. 
the idyll that they both envisaged of working in this wonderful artistic commune never came to fruition. It was a disaster. The reason we know so much about the life and work of the unknown Vincent van Gogh is thanks to the tireless efforts of Joanna Bonga. The epic battles with Paul Gauguin down in Arles, his tortured mental state, the mutilation of his own ear, and of course, the devoted relationship between the artist and his brother, Theo. All of these elements are part of the legend of Vincent van Gogh. So why has Joanna's story largely been forgotten? Well, I suppose Joanna's contribution comes from a lot of people's points of view after the story's ended, after the brothers Van Gogh uh, died. Uh, her role becomes very important. I guess in the public eye, people are really interested in Vincent, and to some extent, they're interested in Theo. But Joanna was further away from them and didn't know Vincent well. She sold more than 250 works of art. Because she has sold them, that's why Van Gogh has grown so famous. I think it's certainly true that her name, Joanna Bonger, is not as well known uh, to the general public as she ought to be because what she did was on an heroic scale in assuring this legacy and assuring the fame of Vincent. She spread him over the world, uh, but still she had about 600 works by Van Gogh, many drawings, 200 paintings, and about 200 pieces of art of other people. The paintings went to the Van Gogh Museum in the 1970s, so everyone just assumes they've been in a museum, and I guess for that reason she's not well known. It's quite possible that Van Gogh would have been completely forgotten without uh, Joanna Bonga, because there would have been very, very few works surviving. She did play a very important role. Without her, so much of the material wouldn't have survived. Vincent, he said, people will only understand my portraits 25 years after, and, and, and he was right. and Goebbels had almost a hit list of everywhere they wanted to go, all the works they wanted to pillage. It was the biggest looting in the history of art. Colossal. It just drains the imagination to think and to read about the scale of it. But the tide of the war turned, and the Allies now had the upper hand. And as the Nazis made their retreat, it became the task of the Monuments men to recover all that they had stolen. This was a group of people who'd worked in museums or who were art historians. Experts in their field who were charged with going across Europe and finding missing works, cataloguing them and returning them back to the original owners. Their mission took them down the deepest of mines and up the highest of castles, the far-flung locations where the Nazis had stored their looted treasures. Many masterpieces were rescued at the last moment, and Herculean efforts were made to save as much as possible from the relentless bombing campaigns. They were very successful, even though there are tens of thousands of items that can't be traced. They all put great efforts into trying to save as much art as possible, and did an enormous job in a relatively short period of time. Not everything was returned, and the hunt continues for the last remaining lost treasures of World War II. The Monuments Men would be formed 
in 1943, 10 years after the Nazi looting of Armageddon. In 1933, Hitler had been elected Chancellor of Germany. From 1933 onwards, there were many forced sales by Jewish families where the argument is they had very little choice. They either needed the money to flee the country or if they hadn't sold the item at the price specified, they would have been sent to concentration camps or in some other way taken advantage of. A brutal form of compulsory purchase if negotiation didn't work, the mailed fist, the threat was there and it was used, particularly with Jewish collectors and dealers. They just moved across Europe, taking from Jewish families, from cultural, cultural institutions, from churches. During the Nuremberg trials, which followed the end of World War II, these art crimes were part of the charges brought up against the high-ranking Nazi officials who were still alive. The confiscation of Jewish homes was carried out as follows. So-called confiscation officials went from house to house in order to collect information as to abandoned Jewish homes. They drew up inventories of those homes and subsequently sealed them. It came up in the questioning and the interrogation. It wasn't a principal indictment against them. It wasn't what was going to hang them, let's put it as crudely as that, because they were being tried for crimes against humanity, planning aggressive war and all that. The planned aggressive war would begin in 1939, when Hitler ordered the invasion of Poland, which marked the beginning of World War II. The invading forces would decimate Polish cities and plunder many of the country's national treasures. In Krakow, the Czartoryski family had one of the finest collections of artworks in the world. The Czartoryskis uh, were one of the great aristocratic families of uh, Poland, and three of their important paintings were seized. There was a Leonardo, a Raphael, and a Rembrandt. Isabella Czartoryska is my six times great-grandmother. She travels around Europe and meets uh, many greats of her time. Rousseau, Voltaire, and Benjamin Franklin, and she starts a museum in her palace. Isabella's eldest son, he travels to Florence and Rome, and with the advice of his younger brother, who is my, uh, my ancestor, they uh, acquire the Leonardo da Vinci painting and the Raphael, and they give it as a gift to Isabella because every mother deserves a Leonardo da Vinci. The Czartoryskis had attempted to thwart the invading German army by moving the paintings outside Krakow to a country house, where they were hidden behind a false brick wall. However, they were unable to stop the Nazis from discovering their location. Augustin Czartoryski decides to move the collection from Krakow to one of his estates, and then decides it's too close to the Russian front and moves it to my great-grandfather's uh, house in Pełkinie. Very soon the Gestapo turns up and they uh, take the artworks. It was a very calculated operation by the Nazis. These priceless works of art would soon be found in the possession of the Nazi official Hans Frank. Hans Frank, totally irredeemably brutal German governor of most of occupied Poland. He was an avid collector of art treasures, which he looted comprehensively from Poland. Dr. Hans Frank, who was a close personal friend of Hitler's, took those three works, which were you know, number one to Hitler, and hung them in his castle in Warburg. They knew exactly what they were doing. The Nazis have uh, appointed an uh, art historian, Kajetan Müllmann, to go around Poland and in search for artworks, among them the, the collection of the Czartoryski Museum. Müllmann, a degenerate, brutal man, but an art historian in his own right, who was an active advisor to the Nazis in Poland and in the Soviet Union as well. There were two factors that influenced what he did and what they did. 
One that was utter racial contempt for Poland and for the Poles. They thought they had no right to a cultural inheritance of their own. And Hans Frank was, he was simply greedy. He wanted it for himself. With the Nazi invasion and ransacking of Poland, other European nations took great precautions to protect their works of art. The National Gallery in London sent almost all of its collection to far safer locations in Wales. The Louvre in Paris also emptied its contents out of fear of Nazi seizure, a fear that would be realized when German forces invaded in May 1940. Not only were the Germans hiding the looted art, but also the Allies were quickly moving things away as the Germans approached and occupation happened. So the Mona Lisa actually moved six times between different chateaux in the French countryside, almost being chased. With Paris and most of France under Nazi control, Hitler and his high-ranking officials had access to an enormous number of precious artworks. In Paris alone, about 20 confiscation officials confiscated more than 38,000 homes. Looted artworks were stored at the Jeu de Poem Gallery in Paris, and at the heart of this systematic confiscation was Alfred Rosenberg. He was appointed with Hitler's approval after the fall of France to coordinate the appropriation of art from occupied Western Europe. Rosenberg was a Hitler protege, a dogma idealist theorist for the Nazi cause. And he was put in charge of the seizure of art in Paris much of which Hitler wanted for his own museum at Linz. Rosenberg was one of the Nazi officials prosecuted at the Nuremberg trials, where his own reports of the looting that he relayed to Adolf Hitler were used against him. I beg of you, my Führer, to give me a chance during my next audience to report to you orally on the whole extent and scope of this art seizure action which will be used as a basis for this later oral report, and also accept three copies of the temporary picture catalogues, which too only show a part of the collection you own. He was ruthless in the way that he, he went about it and helped himself to quite a bit uh, as part of the operation. Rosenberg then closes with this touching tribute to the aesthetic tastes of the Fuhrer, tastes which were satisfied at the expense of the continent, and I quote, I shall take the liberty during the requested audience to give you, my Fuhrer, another 20 folders of pictures with the hope that this short occupation with the beautiful things of art which are nearest to your heart will send a ray of beauty and joy into your revered life, uncle. Rosenberg was in charge of the ERR and the Jeu de Pomme. Now, there were other generals like Goering and so on who were trying to get their share of the booty. The leading Nazi officials had begun following Hitler's example of relentless art collection. The Fuhrer had audacious plans for his own purpose-built museum but the seized paintings in Paris that he hadn't claimed for himself were highly sought after by Hitler's deputies. But little did they know that there was a quiet spy amongst them who was noting down all they were up to. At the start of World War II, the Nazis had looted extensively across the European countries they'd invaded. But many of the greatest works were kept in the Jeu de Pomme gallery in Paris. Hermann Goering would be a regular visitor there, and he would help himself to many seized artworks for his own personal collection. Some of the Nazi leaders became important art collectors, and that was partly because they had the opportunity, they had the power, so they could seize artworks. It's interesting that Goering, who was such an important Nazi figure, became a very major collector and acquired many, many hundreds of works. His image of himself was of some kind of Renaissance man, a man of culture and of taste. And in fact, I think his 
interest in art was genuine in its own way. In some cases, he actually acquired works which were officially regarded as degenerate, which is interesting, which shows the contradictions in the Nazi system. So Goering, for example, acquired a number of Van Goghs. He had the maximum of temptation and the maximum opportunity to appropriate what he wanted. Some of them he acquired just in order to sell and make money from, and then he bought more conventional works, but he did also keep some for himself. And what is extraordinary is the frequency of these visits. Supposedly, he was Hitler's deputy, Reichs Marshal, in command of the Luftwaffe, but these commitments appeared to be no impediment to the time that he found to make these trips to France. But secretly, it was at the Jodapoem Gallery that the work of the Monuments Men, or really, the Monuments Men and Women, began. There was a very brave woman, Rose Valland, who was the uh, curator in the Jeu de Paume, which is next door to the Louvre, and which was the collecting point which the Germans used in Paris to bring together what they were taking from Jewish families and other museums before shipping it to Germany. She basically pretended to be a collaborator with the Germans. She spoke fluent German, but didn't let them know and noted where all the big shipments out of the museum, where all the masterpieces were going to, and flagged it to the Allies. She was in a position to be able to register and record everything that was being sent to Germany and to work out where it was going. The records that Rose Vallon kept would prove key in the recovery efforts, and she would soon get vital assistance when the United States officially joined the war effort and the Monuments, Fine Arts and Archive program was launched. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. Roosevelt signed a decree in 1943 to actually put together a team of individuals who have the requisite expertise. Now, there's always a big problem when you're doing something like this as to how much military credibility the individuals have to have and how much art history credibility. They weren't normal troops. Obviously, they were sent out to work with the Allied forces, but the average age was 40. They had no fighting experience, so they really were uh, not in their comfort zone. An art historian on the battlefield who can't talk with credibility to a field commander will not get what he needs. And somebody who's not an art historian won't know what to do. Altogether, there were several hundred um, people who'd worked in museums or who were art historians who worked for the Allies during the war. And they accompanied soldiers at the end of the war. It was a, originally a United States initiative where the learned societies in America who'd heard about looting in Europe said to the US government, we must do something about this. And they also were aware of the fact that there would be a danger of looting by Allied soldiers who were getting into what had been German-occupied territories. It was always going to happen. It was always going to be part of the, if you like, the moral agenda of the Western Allies to make such restitution as they could to countries that had been looted, despoiled of their own uh, artistic inheritance in the way that occupied countries were. There was every incentive to set up an organization which became multinational, i.e. there were French, Polish, and eventually, of course, German people involved in it, in order to try and safeguard what had been moved or stolen. Uh, and they were very successful. The task was a gargantuan one. The American army claimed at the end of World War II that they had located around a thousand sites, repositories, of what had been hidden away. And did they have the manpower to sort that out adequately or to prevent more of it being stolen and stashed away? We don't, I don't think we know for sure, do we? Two of the most important figures in this new force were George Stout and James Rorimer. Rorimer worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and was a very important art historian. He later wrote his memoirs as his time as a monuments man. People like Stout and Rorimer were very important art historians and conservators. They were among the leading monuments men. To put together the expertise 
you must put somebody in charge of those people who has real military clout, clout with the command and indeed the knowledge tactically to be able to know what is safe and what's not safe and how they should progress. George Stout was an ideal figure to help lead this new group as he was one of the few members to have experience of wartime, having served in World War I himself. And he returned to the battlefield of Europe once again, soon after the D-Day landings. The Monuments men would have to make their way across the continent, hunting down secret locations where the Nazis stored their stolen treasures. And the first locations they found were deep mines that the Nazis had to abandon in their hasty retreat. One of the earliest discovered was the copper mine in Siegen, Germany. Cooper says the crowd's booby-trapped the entire place. Could walk right into one. Bring the whole mine down on top of you. Not true, sir? You found any booby traps? I'm not looking for booby traps. No, sir. The Germans were worried for the safety of artworks. They were worried about um, Allied bombing. Um, so the paintings and artworks were moved from the cities uh, to safe places, uh, initially in the countryside. And it was then realized that the safest place to keep them was in an underground mine. How many tons of rock do you reckon are above us right now? About a million, I'd say. It'd be quick, wouldn't it? All these mines were used to store art when the bombing was clearly a major threat. In these mines were put, in Germany, the items which were going to go to the Führer's museum and so on, and also items particularly from France, which came from the collecting point in the Jeu de Pomme in Paris. You don't worry much, do you, sir? I'm worried now. About booby traps? No. About moisture. Actually happened quite late, before 1945. They started moving pieces across and storing them deep in the mines. And there were thousands of tunnels within it, so it really was a case that was very difficult to find. There were large um, cavernous spaces underground where the artworks were stored. It was reputed that at the end of the war, uh, the Nazis had ordered that the mines should be blown up. But fortunately, this didn't happen, and it was liberated uh, by American forces and the Monuments Men. I think the sheer scale, volume, and beauty of the items that had been taken really amazed uh, not only the commanders, but also the troops. And uh, that is what led to everybody understanding what a huge operation the Germans had got into in order to strip Western Europe. And that is without talking about most of the stuff which they took from Russia and Eastern Europe, much more of which was destroyed. The Monuments men needed to move fast to rescue any more stolen treasures from the endless mine shafts and castle corridors where they were hidden. Hitler had issued the Nero Decree, which threatened to destroy all of these looted works rather than let them fall into the Allies' hands. On May the 26th, 1944, General Eisenhower gave an order to the Allied forces to protect and respect important historical monuments whenever possible in the battles that lay ahead. The job of the Monuments Men was to ensure that this order was carried out. On June the 6th, 1944, the D-Day landings at Normandy were put into action under Operation Overlord. The Monuments Men made their way across the Channel soon after and started to search for the artworks stolen by the Nazis. They knew they had to act fast when on March the 19th, 1945, Hitler issued the Nero Decree from his bunker in Berlin, which ordered for all works to be destroyed rather than let them fall into Allied hands. But the Monuments Men would have a stroke of luck when on April the 2nd, they uncovered the German mine at Siegen, which held works by the likes of Rembrandt and Van Gogh. Just a few days later, they would make an even larger discovery at a salt mine in Merkers. Here, they found crates of artworks, which included the Winter Garden by Manet. 
General Eisenhower would visit the mine to see the stolen art for himself, along with his fellow generals, Omar Bradley and George S. Patton. They were able to witness for themselves the vast amount of gold that had been found at Merkers. A salt mine, a hiding place for a Nazi hoard of gold bullion, currency, jewels, and other forms of wealth. Officers of the American Third Army make an inventory of the treasures which had been removed from Berlin to the Merkers Depository. The almost 200 tons of gold is reported to be virtually the entire remaining bullion reserve of the Reichsbank. A ton of fine gold represents about $1 million. America's hiding place was uncovered by our troops early in April. I mean, it's interesting that General Eisenhower, uh, who had a, a war to fight, chose to be photographed with the artworks which had been recovered. And it was quite a public relations coup for the Americans to show that they had rescued and saved uh, these artworks at the end of the war. Suitcases contain a variety of valuables. It's discovered that the Reichsbank had been buying gold wedding rings, gold teeth, and other loot taken by the Nazis from their innumerable civilian victims. I remember talking to other soldiers from my own regiment who were in Germany at the time. And of course, uh, everybody looted what I would call trophy military kit, you know, swastikas and so on were taken. There were very strict rules about not taking anything which was needed by the German civilian population. We helped repatriate a Bible back to Italy, and there were many cases like that. Valuable works of art are included in the treasure hoard. Approximately 400 rare paintings are found. Removing the Merkur's salt mine hoard takes 24 hours. More than 60 trucks are required to transport it to a central point for storage, pending an Allied decision as to its disposition. These books were found by our staff in connection with the group of U.S. Army people who have assembled these objects of art and are now in the process of returning them to the rightful owners. And the great advantage of salt mines is that they're completely dry. Because they're hygroscopic, you can store things there and they won't degenerate. Naturally, it had perfect conditions, perfect temperature, perfect humidity. And they just started stockpiling all of the masterpieces that they had plundered from across Europe. The Merkur salt mine was a truly remarkable discovery. But the monument's men would soon unearth an even bigger one, thanks to the work of Rose Vallon back in Paris. Her meticulous records had allowed James Rorimer to track down an astonishing collection of artworks held at Neuschwanstein Castle. Harry! Harry, come on! Joining him in his discovery was Private Harry Ettlinger, a German Jew who'd escaped to America before the war and was now returning to his homeland as part of the US Army. At the end of the war, there was this big effort by the Monuments Men to repatriate stuff to the country from which it was taken to make certain these items went back to their original private owners. Neuschwanstein is this fairy tale castle at the foothill of the Alps in Germany and it was used as a repository or safe place for paintings from the Munich collection, uh, a fantastic gallery and it's also more importantly actually the destination for art looted from Jews in France. Neuschwanstein Castle, although it looks medieval, was actually built in the 1860s and it wasn't finished, which meant that it had lots of space, unfinished rooms that adjoin adjoining corridors where they could store multiple pieces of artwork. Tower's over 300 feet tall. At the wartime, there were racks along all of the walls which were absolutely filled with paintings. So there were thousands and thousands of paintings um, in a series of rooms. Then there were the rooms in the main castle itself. Over 300 of them, spread over six floors. I think there were over 21,000 pieces of art stored there. 21,903 pieces of art. These included 5,281 paintings, 684 miniatures, books and manuscripts. It's like something out of a fairy tale. Other rooms with decorative art, with sculpture, 
uh, jewellery, miniatures, medieval works of art. So they also found there some leather-bound books, cards, references of all the works that were on the list to be looted. Paintings, jewellery, rare books and prints, stacks of furniture, all shipped in from Paris. Gold? <laughs> Only two rooms full of it. But the real treasure is right through here. Well, it's fortunate that the Germans, who were meticulous record keepers, but even so, in the chaos of 1945, anything could have happened. The records of what they had taken were found with the items themselves. The Nazi catalogue of their theft, 20,000 records. Where the items came from, who they belonged to. And you're going to translate it. There were filing cabinets full of the cards showing from whom these pictures had originally been taken, which collecting points they'd gone through, uh, and where they were destined for. So that, for the monuments men, would have enabled them to make restitution of these items back to their owners relatively easily. At the same time as the enormous collection at Neuschwanstein Castle was being discovered, yet another stolen art hall was reclaimed, when Hermann Goering was eventually captured. Prize thief among the high Nazis was Hermann Goering, who looted museums and private collections in all parts of Europe. Much was hidden in caves, and advancing troops captured fully laden freight cars, ready to move much of the collection to safer places for Hermann. When the American army caught up with Hermann Göring's collection down at a small place called Untersee near Berchtesgaden. It had been transported down there with the aid of German military transport and military manpower. What they found occupied 40 rooms of a, a Luftwaffe building. It was a Luftwaffe rest home, which Göring had appropriated for his own use. Apparently, he was shifting it, attempting to, both by road and by rail, and apart from what the Americans, the 101st Airborne Division, who were operating in, in South Germany, tracked down to the Luftwaffe building, there was a lot more that was shifted by rail, and I think the Americans intercepted quite a lot of that as well. Goering's ill-gotten loot is no longer his to admire. The collection goes on display for GIs before an Allied Commission attempts to return everything to the proper owners. I call your attention again that each of the pictures you have just seen is merely representative of a large number of similar items illustrated in the 39 volume catalog, which is in itself only partially complete. The stolen art collections of the top Nazi officials were gradually being reclaimed. But the biggest treasure trove of all, that which Hitler had set aside for his own personal museum, was still to be recovered by the monuments men in Austria. But the search continues to this day for all the lost treasures that slipped through the net. the net had closed in on the leading Nazi officials and their stolen art collections. Hermann Goering had been brought into custody by the Allies, along with his enormous hall of artworks. And Hans Frank, the governor of occupied Poland, had been captured by US forces near the German-Austrian border. He had an extensive collection of looted paintings, including the famous Czartoryski collection, which featured The Lady with an Ermine by Leonardo da Vinci, The Landscape with Good Samaritan by Rembrandt, and The Portrait of a Young Man by Raphael. Both Goering and Frank would eventually be tried at Nuremberg. At the end of the war, in 1944, when they were evacuating Poland with the Russian invasion from the east, Dr. Frank took the Leonardo and probably the others back to his own private residence in the south of Germany. Frank took the pictures um, to his country house and two of them were later recovered, uh, the Rembrandt and the Leonardo. The Raphael is still missing and it's 
possibly the most important artwork that was looted and lost during the war. It's right down here, sir. Frank insists he didn't steal them, says he was just safeguarding them. We found it just lying here on the floor. Have a look. The Leonardo, it's a very important portrait, and um, it had a boot print on it, and um, it's lucky it didn't suffer more damage. Is that it? A boot, sir. Yes. Whoever was in here earlier sure will get out in a hurry. Jeez. Oh, There's a famous photograph of it on a railway platform, and fortunately the painting um, survived in relatively good condition, considering its checkered history during the war, and it's now one of the most important Leonardo's. It's been estimated that over 800 objects are missing from the museum, and among them, the Raphael. The Raphael is still missing, and it's possibly the most important artwork that was looted and lost during the war. Portrait of a man, and many people think it's actually a self-portrait of Raphael. Sadly, only one was never found, Raphael's portrait of a young man, and that was last seen at Varvel. And there have been some supposed sightings of it. There was speculation that uh, maybe after 50 or 70 years, it might turn up somewhere when supposedly the case expires. There were thoughts of it being locked in a bank, which then got proved to be a hoax. So it's largely thought now that it is missing. We have no evidence of what happened to it. And it's just possible it might turn up in someone's attic at some point. The Raphael painting may be the most famous missing work from the Czartoryski collection, but many other great pieces of art have still not turned up. This 15th century work by Italian artist Naroccio de Landi is still missing, as is a work called Saint with a Book that was stolen to order for Hitler's private collection. Hans Frank and Hermann Goering's stolen caches of art had been recovered, but the greatest collection of all had been assembled for the Führer himself. He had plans for his own purpose-built art museum in his hometown of Linz and its vast contents were being stored in a salt mine elsewhere in Austria. There was a great sycophantic effort by senior Nazis to, to suck up to Hitler. And one of the things they did when they put together these items which they confiscated in France or other countries was then to record them in leather-bound volumes for him and eventually those leather-bound volumes would have presumably been part of the inventory for the Linz Museum. And then some of those volumes were discovered by the Monuments Men. By early 1945, Hitler was dead and Germany had surrendered, which meant that the Monuments Men were now racing against the invading Soviet Union to get to Hitler's vast collection. Getting to the sites where the Monuments Men guessed there would be valuable stuff that could be found. I don't think that could ever be a military priority, of course. They had given up in Berlin by March 1945. It was really an unadmitted deal that the Soviets were going to get to Berlin first. But as the byproduct of ultimate military victory, there came access to the sites. The Monuments Men were on their way to their final target, which held the biggest treasure trove of all. Their mission thus far had seen many successful recoveries, but much had been lost forever in the fighting. In Florence, Italy, bridges that had been designed by Michelangelo had been blown up by the retreating German forces. And in the Battle of Monte Cassino of 1944, Allied bombing had brought the centuries-old abbey to ruins. It was a fanatically defended and almost impregnable German position on the way to Rome. If the Allies were to advance up Italy, Monte Cassino was the pivotal position they had to take. There was no question about that. But the price, apart from the lives lost, was the destruction of the Abbey. Prior to the onslaught of the Allies on the monastery, the Hermann Göring SS division 
offered its services to the Benedictine abbot of the monastery to shift from the monastery's cellars. So they shifted something like 100 truckloads of stuff, priceless stuff, from the abbey's cellars, shifted it north to Spoleto near Rome. And needless to say, some of the shipment found its way to Hermann Göring's uh, personal collection. Bombing campaigns had also caused huge damage to the Campo Santo building in Pisa. Dean Keller of the Monuments Men did everything within his power to rescue what he could amongst the ruins. But there was danger of a truly catastrophic loss of works occurring if the Monuments Men didn't get to Altersee in time, where Hitler's collection was being stored. The Nazi in charge of the mine was planning on blowing the whole thing up. The Gauleiter in charge, when he received the so-called Nero decree from Hitler, which said that everything was to be destroyed, that order was, of course, countermanded by many local commanders and countermanded by Speer in relation to things like the bridges in, in Berlin. So 90% of the Germans knew that that was a stupid order. But this guy, who was a dedicated Nazi, he tried to destroy everything in the mine by planting bombs in it. What happened eventually, he planted six bombs in the mine. Those bombs were removed by the miners and his own troops. And then one bomb was blown up at the entrance to make it look as though all of them had been exploded. And that was really to fool their commander. When the Monuments men were able to make their way into the Altersee mine, they were astonished by what they found. Hitler thought of himself in a bizarre way as a trustee for the German people of an art collection that he could build up thanks to the opportunities that war and victory provided. In the Altrausi mine were some of the best works which Hitler himself wanted for his own collection, Leda and the Swan, the Vermeer Astronomer. There were some of the really best possible pictures which were stored there. Among the paintings which were for the destined for the museum, there were a couple of Vermeers. Uh, there was one from the Channing Collection in Vienna and another from the Rothschilds family in Paris. Hitler didn't luxuriate in his own collection in the way that Goering did. Uh, a lot of what Hitler collected was kept stored, carefully documented and photographed. Hitler, of course, entertained the fantasy of a, an art museum at Linz, close to where he was born in Upper Austria. We have these images, and in fact, there's photographic proof of Hitler, even in the final days of the war, poring over the grandiose architectural plans for this museum in Linz. This is typical of the important works of art, the masterpieces, which were seized by Hitler for his grandiose museum. It was the biggest concentration of art probably ever assembled in the world, I should think. Astonishing episode, because there was so much there. And it was perfect because of temperatures, and it was well thought out from the Germans' point of view. And it was an extraordinary treasure true of what the Ghent altarpiece was there. The Ghent altarpiece from the Cathedral of St. Bavo um, has had a very checkered history in that it was being seized during wartime on a number of occasions. There's some descriptions of them finding the altarpiece and coming across these works. They had no crates, they didn't have proper equipment, so really they were finding these works which we now know as sort of the forefront of the history of art, but we're covering them in jackets, gas masks to transport them. The Michelangelo Madonna of Bruges was also there. Extraordinary. Michelangelo's Madonna at the church in Bruges is very important, one of the greatest Renaissance sculptures. And uh, during the war, that was seized by the Germans. That was taken by German soldiers when they were retreating in 19... 44, uh, they were taken uh, actually in a Red Cross truck, so in breach of every Geneva Convention as well as in breach of the Hague Convention, as it were. Hitler's vision of a post-war future was of everything that he'd acquired going down to Linz. Goring, in a curious way, vied with Hitler. There was rivalry between them. 
But in a strange way, both of them were thinking ahead to the future of a, a Reich that was going to last for a thousand years, and they had obligations to the to Aryan people to let them see this stuff. They knew what they were looking for. I think it's easy to think of just a few key places like Altersee, but actually I think there was over 1,500 locations found by the American army in Germany alone, let alone all across Europe. So there were these sort of safe houses of artworks. There could still be more out there. In fact, just a couple of years ago, a painting by the Polish artist Alexander Gorymski, which had been looted in World War II, turned up at an auction in Hamburg. It was returned to its original home of Warsaw, and its discovery indicates that other missing artworks could also be found someday. The estimates, the figures, conflict fairly wildly, don't they, about the, the total that was, was stolen. Virtually all of the items which are missing are on our database, and we are looking for them all the time. Now, they may have been sitting in an attic for 80 years now, and when they're discovered, nobody knows what they are. So it's necessary to have our searching procedure, searching three or 400,000 items a year, in order to find those items that have not yet been returned. But one thing's for certain, if it hadn't been for the Monuments Men, so much of Europe's history and greatest achievements would have been lost forever.
status, few are aware that it was once stolen from the Louvre and was considered lost for two years. It was a sensational thing when it happened. Many people have forgotten that and not many people know about it. In 1911, an unknown intruder made his way into the museum and left with one of Europe's greatest treasures. The museum opened, the crowd started coming in, and people started noticing the empty space on the wall. A frantic effort was made to recover this priceless work of art, but the police had few leads to go on. Newspapers around the world ran theories of who was behind the theft, from wealthy industrialists to enemy nations. At the time, it was all over the place. It was the biggest news story of its day. It wouldn't have been stolen if it didn't have some remarkable status, but clearly that got worldwide coverage, front page of newspapers. It really catches people's imagination of having something completely priceless like in a very normal kind of domestic situation. Little did they know that it was hidden in a small apartment in the city the whole time. If people throughout the world, but particularly in the Western civilization, were to say what was the most famous painting, they would say the Mona Lisa. So the theft of it is probably the most easily recognizable theft. It's a very Thomas Crown affair thing, isn't it? It's the thrill of the chase. The story of how the Mona Lisa was eventually recovered is just one of the many mysteries surrounding the painting. And in fact, even though Leonardo da Vinci has an unsurpassed reputation, many of his works surprisingly went missing after he died and have had to survive similarly precarious journeys. The search continues to this day to find all of the lost works of the quintessential Renaissance man. The Mona Lisa has always been a painting surrounded in mystery, ever since the day Leonardo da Vinci first painted it in Florence in around 1503. It's generated quite the reputation. Certainly it was a very, very important painting when he was alive and it was very influential. It was admired and particularly what caught people's imagination was the technique that he used in order to turn that face into something a little more mysterious than the average painting. What Leonardo is incredibly good at and very innovative in, in portraits is suggesting the portrait is looking at something. What he's immensely interested in is how the eyes communicate. He called them windows of the soul. When Leonardo was painting it, artists, his contemporaries, all flocked to see it because it was so new and so unique and so different than anything, and it proved to be a real inspiration to them, especially someone like Raphael, who modeled, I know, one of his paintings after this, with a similar look, and also had the same positioning as the Mona Lisa. Leonardo became so attached to the painting himself that he was unable to part with it during his lifetime. There's a lot of discussion why Leonardo never parted with the Mona Lisa during his lifetime. I don't think anyone has any clear-cut uh, answers to that. Some people think that he simply just didn't finish it and that he took it with him because he was a very slow, uh, methodical worker. Plus, he got distracted by a lot of other things. He was, as usual, distracted by other commissions. It took about probably four years or maybe longer. And through distraction, different travels, he took it with him and never parted from it. For over a century, the Mona Lisa had been one of the greatest treasures held in the Louvre in Paris. But in 1911, it would vanish without trace. In the early 1900s, museums like the Louvre weren't so worried about things like theft as they were about fire. That's one of the reasons why the paintings were never bolted to the walls. They were all, always hung loosely so that they could be removed in case of an emergency. There was also a lot of vandalism that was taking place. People unhappy with their lives, unhappy with their economic situation, 
would protest by going into the state-run Louvre and desecrate some of the paintings. People would actually stab paintings with scissors and with knives uh, to protest. So the Louvre uh, decided that they needed to take some action. So they wanted to put all the major masterpieces behind glass. And a lot of people were up in arms, but the Louvre saw no other way to protect uh, these great works of art. And Vincenzo Perugia was one of the five men sent to the Louvre to, uh, to work on the paintings, who helped cut and clean the glass. But Vincenzo Perugia had hatched a plan to steal the Mona Lisa. And on the 21st of August, 1911, he put his plan into action. Vincenzo Perugia was not what you'd call a common criminal or one of these suave, sophisticated art thieves that you see in the films. He was an immigrant workman. He was born in a town called Dumenza, Italy, and he would emigrate every year to France and specifically to Paris to work. Perugia was a painter decorator. He was the oldest son. He had three brothers and a sister and his parents, and uh, you know, work was hard to come by in Italy, and he was the oldest who went out and, and tried to provide for his family. This was not the first time that the Mona Lisa had been taken out of the Louvre. None other than Napoleon Bonaparte had once had the painting moved from the Louvre into one of his bedrooms during his reign as emperor. And it was this connection with Napoleon that spurred Vincenzo Perugia to action. Vincenzo Perugia seemed to have thought Napoleon looted it, and he looted lots of things from Italy, and indeed the Leonardo manuscripts in the Institut de France, still in France, um, a Napoleonic loot. One day Perugia was waiting to, uh, to start the job and he picked up a book that was lying around in the workroom and he saw this great caravan of statues and paintings that were being brought to France by Napoleon's army. He came to think that all the Italian artwork in the Louvre had been stolen by Napoleon. He was thinking not that Francis I had bought this years ago and actually had a reasonable claim to it, but that it was stolen property. And um, he, he seems to have believed that. Perugia really thought that um, it was Napoleon who had taken the painting as he had stolen many other paintings. So it was a patriotic act. He was returning the painting to its uh, original country. He got the idea that he was going to take a painting back to Italy. And if he did, well, he'd be a hero, and maybe the government would give him some money. And it was uh, his belief that uh, he was going to do the Italian country a favor. Vincenzo Perugia had stolen the Mona Lisa on a Monday morning, but it was not until Tuesday that the museum realized it was missing. When word got out, it would cause a sensation around the world, but especially on the streets of Paris. With one of her greatest treasures now vanished, it was the talk of the town, and rumors spread like wildfire. On Tuesday, when the painting disappeared, and the police came, searched the Louvre, found the empty frame, they knew that something was wrong. The newspapers break the story of the Mona Lisa being stolen. And this news rocks Paris. In fact, it, it goes all around the world. This was when newspapers were probably at their peak. Literally millions of copies of every newspaper were printed uh, every day, and this was front page news story. Everyone loves the story of you know, a high story and art theft. It's incredibly exciting. I think everyone has that feeling when you walk in to a museum. I, mean, I remember being a child and kind of wanting to wonder what would happen if you pulled a painting off the wall. You know, it's, everyone is fascinated by it. And I think even in 1911, you know, they would close all the ports, there were police everywhere.
So in the grand discussion of who the suspects were, a lot of people pointed their fingers at wealthy Americans. Because at the time, Americans were very much on the hunt for European artwork. And J.P. Morgan was probably at the top of the list. He was certainly, if not the wealthiest man in the world, one of them. And he was spending a lot of that wealth on bringing to America uh, the great treasures of Europe. There were certain camps that had their own theories about exactly what was wrong. The prefect of Paris police, a man named Louis Lapine, very famous at the time. In fact, some newspapers had called him the greatest policeman in the world. His theory was that the painting was taken by an agent of a foreign power who was gonna blackmail the Louvre uh, for cash or for other political reasons, or he thought it was just a disgruntled employee. With World War I just around the corner, it was no surprise that Germany was seen as a potential culprit for the crime. There were other conspiracy theories. Some people thought that the Germans, who were the enemies of the French, sent an agent in to steal France's greatest treasure in order to provoke war. Everybody was trying to come up with their own angle of where the painting was. But only one man in the world knew where the Mona Lisa was being held, Vincenzo Perugia. And while he kept the painting in his Paris apartment, all sorts of people were accused of the crime. The finger was even pointed at a young artist, just making a name for himself in Paris, Pablo Picasso. He soon found himself in the fire. Vincenzo Perugia had successfully pulled off the heist of the century, thanks to some weak security at the Louvre and a slice of good fortune. But Perugia had been misinformed about the Mona Lisa's history. His audacious plan may have been successful, but he was incorrect in his belief that Napoleon had once looted the painting. Its rightful home was not in Italy, but in the Louvre in Paris where he had taken it from. Leonardo himself had spent the last three years of his life in the employment of King Francis I of France. Having started the Mona Lisa in around 1503, Leonardo was never fully satisfied with the painting, and 13 years later took it with him to the French royal court. It is said that King Francis joined Leonardo on his deathbed. But what is known for certain is that the king purchased the Mona Lisa for more than a princely sum, and it was placed in the palace of Fontainebleau. During the French Revolution, it found itself the property of the people of France and was placed in the Louvre. But that didn't stop Napoleon from claiming the painting for himself. The Mona Lisa did hang above Napoleon's bed for a while. It was after that returned to the Louvre, to what became then the Louvre of the people of France when the monarchy was restored. However, when the Mona Lisa was returned to its rightful home, it wasn't exactly the center of attention as this painting by Samuel Morse demonstrates. Vincenzo Perugia was stuck with a masterpiece in his apartment and no plans for what to do with it. While he tried to lay low, the rest of Paris remained captivated by the theft of one of the city's greatest treasures. This was a front page news story, and it lasted not for, for hours or days or weeks, but months, and actually, ultimately, two and a half years. This was still in the paper with people looking for the Mona Lisa. It wouldn't have been stolen if it didn't have some remarkable status, but clearly that got worldwide coverage for the photographs of people queuing to see the gap. People queued up to look at the empty wall in the Louvre and look at the pegs that were up on the wall. So it became much more famous at the time. You know, even Kafka went to go and have a look um, at the wall. So it definitely was almost kind of a tourist attraction as the empty space of the Mona Lisa. And I'm sure that did, you know, up the profile. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a Da Vinci. And eventually, the Parisians, in their way, started making jokes. There, were, there was a series of funny postcards put out saying, uh, where is the Mona Lisa today? And on one, she's in London playing the guitar in front of Big Ben. And another, she's shopping in downtown Paris. Her image started appearing on 
cookie boxes, uh, tobacco tins. The Mona Lisa became a commodity because of the fame. And a lot of people say that it is the fame of the theft that made the Mona Lisa as well known as she is today. The police tried desperately to catch the culprit, and one of those accused of the crime was Pablo Picasso, who had recently made a name for himself in the art world. Both he and his close friend Guillaume Apollinaire fell under suspicion, especially since Apollinaire had once claimed that the Louvre should be burnt to the ground. Apollinaire's real name was Guillaume Kostrovitsky. He was of Polish descent, but he lived in Paris. He made his name in Paris. He was very well known. Pablo Picasso was just starting to make a name for himself uh, in the art world. He was an artist that had really embraced life in Paris and that had been really formative in, in the beginnings of his fame, which he was obviously already getting there. You know, he had done Demoiselle, it had been an absolute outrage, but he was becoming a pretty famous guy by that point. Polinaire and Picasso were accused of the theft of the Mona Lisa, partly because Picasso had been found in the possession of some statuettes, Iberian statuettes, that uh, had been stolen from the Louvre. I didn't know he still had them. The finger was pointed because he did already own, in inverted commas, pieces of work which were taken from the Louvre, so it was an obvious implication of, of Picasso. Hello. What are you doing? Your friend is a liar. The police wanted to know how Picasso had these uh, stolen statues in the Louvre in his possession. Well, Picasso had bought them, but he didn't know that they were stolen. He is jealous. I never bought the statues. I've never seen the statues. He bought them from this man who sold them for just a few pounds. Now, the man happened to be an assistant of Apollinaire. We'll throw them in the river. Hello. No one will know they were here. Just, just, just calm down. This is your fault. You introduced us. They'll have me deported for this. Don't you see? Picasso used these two Iberian statues as models, as inspiration, for one of uh, his famous paintings at the time, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. So Picasso had used this as inspiration. In fact, he still had these statues in a closet in his apartment. So when the news broke, Picasso started to be a little worried about this. This is ridiculous. Just give me a moment. We should just get rid of them now. We'd be seen. Pablo, we, we just have to wait. It'll be dark soon. Come on. You're winning. I don't see why we're playing this stupid game. Picasso and Apollinaire were so spooked that Apollinaire went to the newspaper and confessed. He was arrested. Uh, Picasso was brought in for questioning. He was held, not charged, and released. Uh, Polinaire sat in jail for eight days. Police thought that there was an international gang of art thieves behind the theft of the Mona Lisa. He was ultimately released because there was no proof. Apollinaire had declared that in his uh, quest for modernity, the Louvre should be burned. So I suppose the two things joined in, particularly the theft of the statuettes, but they were released very, very soon. It wasn't his home, it wasn't his culture or country, so to be seen as kind of stealing pieces of work which belonged to the nation probably wasn't ideal. Polinaire was so damaged by the fact that his loyalty to France uh, was called into question that he volunteered to fight in the war and he became injured through shrapnel and eventually died. So because of the theft of Mona Lisa and the scandalous uh, accusation that Apollinaire had to live through, the theft of the Mona Lisa, you could say, killed Apollinaire. While Picasso and Apollinaire fell under suspicion, the real culprit, Vincenzo Perugia, had become restless and made an attempt to sell the painting on. He contacted Alfredo Geri, an art dealer in Florence, claiming he wanted to return the Mona Lisa to Italy. Alfredo Geri was an art dealer in 
Florence, Italy. He was a well-known dealer at the time, owning an art auction house. He had placed ads in a lot of newspapers saying he was looking for antiques to buy. Uh, one of the ads he, he placed was in an Italian paper, the Perugia Red in Paris. He wrote him a letter. He said, Signor Jetty, I have the Mona Lisa and it is my fond wish to bring it to Italy, where I hope it will remain in the Uffizi Gallery forever. He chose to sign his letter with the name Leonardo. So Jetty gets this letter. And he looks at it going, all right, this is a joke, this is crazy, I'm gonna throw this, throw this away. But then, he has second thoughts. Came this morning. So what Jetty does is go see Giovanni Poggi. Poggi is the director of the Uffizi Gallery, Florence's biggest museum. If Perugia wants to return the Mona Lisa to the Uffizi, He's got to have the permission of Poggi. Another copy, I would imagine. Right back. Inform him you wish to examine the painting before buying. Let's bring Leonardo back to Florence. The Mona Lisa was finally close to being recovered. Perugia would take the painting on a train from Paris to meet Alfredo Geri and Giovanni Poggi, looking for a handsome reward for the return of the Mona Lisa. Vincenzo Perugia had stolen the Mona Lisa in August 1911 leaving the Paris police baffled. He had kept the painting hidden in his apartment for two years, unsure of his next move. During this time, accusations were thrown around the city and people began to lose hope of a recovery. But in 1913, Perugia finally decided to act when he attempted to sell the painting in Florence. He had arranged to meet with an art dealer called Alfredo Geri. Both he and the director of the Uffizi Gallery Giovanni Poggi didn't know what to expect. Come in. Signor Jerry? Leonardo? Yes. You have the object? She's safe. Don't worry. Can we see it? They all walk over to the hotel. They climb the stairs to Perugia's room. They're both looking at each other, Jerry and Poggi, going, what have we gotten into? You know, the, this guy staying in this flea bag hotel. Uh, he doesn't look like anybody who could pull off this crime. But we're here. They go into the room and he, he opens the trunk. He starts taking all this junk out of the trunk. His mandolin, old shoes, his paintbrushes, old clothes. He removes the false bottom and under there is an object wrapped in red cloth. That. Poggi's thinking, this is the real painting. So he calmly tells Perugia, well, I've got to do more tests on this. You know, I've got to uh, inspect this a little closer at, at the Uffizi. Can we take it back to the museum? And Perugia says yes. So they go back to the Uffizi, and Poggi brings out some big photographs that he has of the Mona Lisa. I simply did what any patriotic Italian would have done. I bought her home. You do expect to be paid, though, I assume. If the government were to reward my duty with some small gift, it would be wrong of me to refuse. I want 500,000 lira. It's a 400-year-old painting at this time, and the varnish on the painting has been cracked uh, over the years. Sure, you can forge the Mona Lisa, but there's no way you're going to replicate each one of those thousands and thousands of cracks. If it's real. It's real. There are marks on this no forger could know. It's real. 
So Paggi's comparing the photograph with, with the actual Mona Lisa, and he thinks that it's legitimate. And they tell Perugia to go back to his hotel, that they'll be in touch. Satisfied they had the real thing, Jerry and Poggi contacted the police. And Vincenzo Perugia was arrested for the art theft of the century. The news of the recovery of the Mona Lisa breaks worldwide. The news of its recovery is even bigger than the news of its theft. His apartment in Paris, where he hid the painting for so long, was extensively searched by the police. Amazingly, Perugia only served a few months in jail and became a hero to many in Italy for his actions. I've looked at the testimony in court and so on, and I think he's a pretty dysfunctional guy. You wouldn't say that he was somebody who pursued things in very logical sequences, and I think, yeah, that probably the initial motive, he always claimed that he thought Napoleon had looted it from Italy. I think Perugia came out with this nonsense about Napoleon at some point, not realizing that there was, had been a king in France called Francis I. <laughs> it so happened the king had asked Leonardo for a painting <laughs> and bought it from him. I think people love to get behind their own. You know, da Vinci is obviously one of the most iconic artists that there is in Italy. And, you know, to be taken by Italian and returns, or, you know, to be in the hands of an Italian seizing it for, to return it to its natural home, I think is probably a kind of quite a romantic idea that people liked, you know, that got behind and, and kind of took interest in the story. Perugia was celebrated somewhat. In Florence, people sent money to Perugia in jail. They sent gifts to him. People offered to, to pay his bail. So in some ways, uh, you know, he was a hero that way. But eventually all that wore off. Uh, he was arrested in December 1913. He was put on trial in June 1914. They were perilously close to the First World War. People had other things in mind other than the trial of the man who stole the Mona Lisa. The simple truth is that idiotic trophy art heists get you nowhere if you're the criminal, and they're a pain in the backside to law enforcement authorities because they just go on and on and on. They cost money. It's worse for the, for the criminals themselves. They, they have no clue what to do. Before the Mona Lisa was returned to the Louvre, it was sent on a tour of Italy. Since then, its only other foreign visits have been to Moscow, Tokyo, and the US, where it was presented by President Kennedy. One of Washington's most distinguished throngs is at the National Gallery of Art to welcome a distinguished visitor. President and Mrs. Kennedy, with French cultural minister André Mulroy and his wife, pay homage to the first public appearance of Mona Lisa a Leonardo da Vinci painting that has captured the fancy of generations for 400 years. When it went to New York, it had a kind of royal reception with uh, J.F. Kennedy and Jacqueline Kennedy. Mr. Minister, we in the United States are grateful for this loan from the leading artistic power in the world, France. The Mona Lisa has only been out of France three times, Moscow and Tokyo. In 1963, when the French government loaned her to the United States, where she was displayed in New York and in Washington, D.C., and in 1913, when Vincenzo Perugia took her to Italy. It was allowed out for a short time, but um, it's been in the Louvre uh, securely for a long time, and it's only allowed out once a year when it's checked out for its uh, condition. And rest assured, security now is a lot tighter than it was back in 1911. She hasn't been out that much, and one of those times was, was by the man who stole her. You can't justify it, you can't say that it was ever a good thing, but it, the outcome of it were good things. Museums knew now if a painting is removed from the wall, put a little tag on the wall that says that the, the painting is somewhere else. Security was bolstered. It really opened up a whole new world of, of what a painting like the Mona Lisa could do. There are lots of stories about um, stealing art and famous pieces of art. It seems impossible that one uh, should do it because they're so well known. Another painting by Leonardo that was stolen, the um, Madonna of the Unwinder, that was stolen from the Duke of Buccleuch's collection in Scotland. 
the Madonna of the Yarnwinder was taken in a daring heist in 2003. The painting was hanging in Drumlanrig Castle when a gang of four men took it at knife point in broad daylight. The police contacted me and said, let's talk about the picture and what do we do if we recover it? How do we tell it's Leonardo? I was able to tell the police I've got good forensic evidence which are not available to the thief. So if they attempted to, to replicate the painting and give you back <laughs> the replica, then I can tell you and they, they rather like that. As the months turned into years, it was feared to have been lost to the criminal underworld. The Duke asked me my um, advice about what he really ought to do to get the picture back to protect his collection. And I explained my reasons to him, and so he thanked me for my advice. <laughs> the Strathclyde police were trying a covert operation to recover the painting. The important thing is to get the picture back, and they got it back. The painting was recovered in 2007 from thieves who were trying to use it as collateral as part of other illegal operations. I got a call from the police saying, um, there's been developments, can you help us? And uh, after a bit, I went up to Edinburgh and um, the picture was then in the conservation studios of the National Galleries of Scotland being examined. And you could walk into the room and I could say, oh yeah, that's the original, but we could reconstruct evidence of the underdrawing. So um, again, it helped the police to have something which wasn't just an art historian coming in and saying, yeah, that's obviously Leonardo. There was really hard evidence that this was the real thing. But why do people steal famous works of art that they could never sell on? We know that uh, there are reasons for stealing works of art that are to do with um, using them as collaterals for drug purposes or for money laundering or for criminal purposes. So it's less to do with a wealthy individual keeping the painting for themselves, some sort of obsession with the work of art, and it's probably more to do with uh, big criminal acts, except for the case of Perugia, of course. The story of Vincenzo Perugia's theft is only one of the mysterious events surrounding the Mona Lisa and all of Leonardo's works. It's been a battle to try and hunt down the very few paintings he worked on in his life, many of which went missing over the centuries. In fact, in just the last few years, two previously unknown works were unveiled that many claim are by Leonardo's hand. The Mona Lisa was lost for a period of two years before it was gratefully recovered in 1913. But many other of Leonardo's paintings have gone missing for a lot longer than that. In fact, in just the last few years, two previously unknown works were unveiled. Based at Oxford University, Professor Martin Kemp, the leading international authority on the Renaissance genius, led the team that authenticated the first work of art by Leonardo to appear for over a century, La Bella Principessa. I get sent new Leonardos more regularly than I care to confess, and most of them are pretty absurd. Uh, you get some things which are promising, that, you know, you think, well, that's school of Leonardo or maybe by a pupil. This came through as a quite decent quality digital file. And I thought, that's, it's almost too good to be true. You know, it's very pretty, very beautifully executed, but you always say, don't believe it. You go in, or you should go in, with an enormous amount of skepticism. With Leonardo, it's very difficult because he tackled almost every project as a one-off. It seems every painting, every project he did, he thought it through, if not from the ground upwards, he certainly thought about new ways of doing it, new media, and so on. There was an added layer of intrigue with this drawing, as it was on vellum, a medium that is not part of any other known work by Leonardo. The fact it was on vellum cuts both ways. We know that Leonardo is very experimental in his media, and it's very difficult to say he did not use vellum. Um, but equally, the fact, you know, if you were doing something which you're pretending to be Leonardo, a deliberate deception, you wouldn't choose that medium, which makes life difficult for you. But I did know that Leonardo discussed working on vellum, so it wasn't a total surprise. Only a handful of paintings are universally accepted to be by Leonardo da Vinci's hand. Scholars argue over the attribution of many of the paintings, and La Bella Principessa is no different. 
If we look at Leonardo's work, only the Last Supper has a continuous history, which is a surprise. You think the Mona Lisa has and so on, but they all have breaks in their provenance, i.e. the history of who owned them. Um, so each one comes out in a somewhat different way. Amazingly, right after La Bella Principessa was found, yet another work has been attributed to Leonardo, the Salvatore Mundi. After its attribution, it sold for over $70 million. We had drawings for the Salvatore Mundi by Leonardo. We had masses of copies and the picture being completely overpainted. Um, it's painted on walnut panel, which had warped over time. It tented, i.e. the grain pushed up. And somebody simply took a plane or some shaving device and they shaved off the ridges. So it's very badly damaged. Somebody completely overpainted it. Um, looking back now on the black and white photographs, you can see areas which say this is worth looking at. But overall, I described as looking at a drug-crazed hippie. And it, yeah, it's simply an unattractive thing. Once all the overpaint was stripped off, you could see that you've got a kind of archaeological version of a, of a Leonardo, and it absolutely shouts Leonardo. Uh, it's been restored, that's to say the missing areas have been diplomatically filled in. Just like the Salvatore Mundi, other works by Leonardo that have had to find their way back into his canon include The Lady with an Ermine, The Benoit Madonna, and The Ginevra di Benci. But there may be yet another hiding behind a wall in Florence, the Battle of Anghiari. I've always been fascinated with Leonardo, mostly because of uh, not only his great successes, but his great failures. And one of his great failures is the, the Battle of Anghiari, this, this massive mural of uh, one of the battles in, in Italian uh, uh, Florentine history uh, that he had painted. But because he used a new technique, the paint wasn't adhering to the walls. He was notorious for trying out different techniques, and so the fresco painting requires a specific uh, keying into the actual fresh plaster. Leonardo tried to, to, to dry the paint by putting uh, uh, these, these large urns with fire at the base uh, of the, the, the great mural to, to dry the paint, but instead of drying it, it caused all the paint to run. That technique was, uh, was an haphazard technique. I mean, he, he was experimental. That's really what he was doing. He was a, a scientist as well as an artist. We still have the preparatory studies that Leonardo da Vinci made for the Battle of Anghiari, as well as a copy made by Peter Paul Rubens in 1603. But the original remains elusive. Some people think that it's still being preserved and think it's behind another painting in the Palazzo Vecchio, a painting done by Vasari. The Battle of Anghia research has been going on since uh, the late 1970s in one form or another, and at one point a bit of plaster was removed from a wall and disclosed nothing. Maurizio Serracini's search has got entangled in Florentine politics, and uh, Florentine politics are, in the art world, uh, hideously complicated. Well, the Battle of Anghiari was definitely painted on the walls of the Palazzo Vecchio, so we have documentation for that. In fact, we know that Leonardo started it the year he started the Mona Lisa in 1503, but um, unlikely that it will be found. There are clues in Vasari's painting that behind this, there's Leonardo's masterpiece. He says, I think in one of the flags in the painting, it says, seek and ye shall find. So, this uh, Italian art historian, you know, had been drilling holes in, in, uh, in obtrusive places in the Vasari to put cameras in, and he's seen things behind there that the, he thinks are uh, paint from the time of Leonardo. If it is in a space between these two walls, that there's a wall in which Leonardo painted and there's the wall in which Vasari painted, and I'm not convinced there's, there's really much of a gap between them. There are searches to find the painting under the wall have really not led to any results yet. So I think it's unlikely, even though quite a lot of people are interested in searching for it. I hope they find the Battle of Anghiari. It would be uh, just incredible. It would be the largest uh, Leonardo uh, ever found. The struggle continues to see if the Battle of Anghiari has survived. And while that painting may not have been recovered, people continue to claim that new works by Leonardo have been found. There has even been a claim that an earlier version of the Mona Lisa was unearthed. 
There was a huge trumpeted announcement of the discovery of the first version of the Mona Lisa. Not very pretty on canvas, and it was owned by somebody who lived in Isleworth. Uh, so it's known as the Isleworth Mona Lisa, which uh, I don't want to be rude about Isleworth, but it's not the most probable place to, to, find, uh, to find the Mona Lisa. And it was accompanied by this big book with gold-edged, very fat, with masses of so-called evidence. I see quite a lot of Leonardo attributions which come with fat folios of stuff. And it's almost as if you accumulate enough pages and you have enough scientific analysis, enough graphs, enough pigment analysis and so on that somehow proves something. I think you can demonstrate fairly clearly it belongs to one of a small family of copies. I'd be interested in finding out more about it, but um, not under the coercion that it has to be an early version of, uh, of the Mona Lisa. In 2012, another Mona Lisa story broke when a copy of the painting was discovered at the Prado Museum in Spain. It was displayed at the Louvre and is thought to be by one of Leonardo's pupils, and therefore the earliest known copy of the original painting. Leonardo da Vinci had many admirers during his lifetime, and his masterpieces were extensively copied by his pupils, the Leonardeschi. These copies are still being unearthed, but could any more lost works by the master himself ever turn up? As far as other discoveries go of completely new material, you can't rule that out. It's not very usual that they are found. It's quite slow finding Leonardo's, even though there are lots of people who maintain all the time that they're around. It's wonderful that in recent times we've uncovered these, these new Leonardo's. He didn't do that much work, and to find new things is, is remarkable. The last painting before the Salvatore Mundi be, to be discovered was early 20th century. And that's the Benoit Madonna in uh, St. Petersburg and the uh, Hermitage in Russia. I'm working on an internet edition of the Leonardo manuscript owned by Bill Gates. Remarkably, if you look at the thousands of existing pages really hard, you still discover new things. But while more works by Leonardo da Vinci may eventually be found someday, no recovery could be quite as remarkable as the story of Vincenzo Perugia and the theft of the Mona Lisa. The painting continues to cast its spell over the world. This is a famous painting. It's a mystery, it's an icon. It's, it's, it's one of the few things on, on Earth that practically everyone on Earth knows. And, and for that, she's celebrated and, and in demand. I think there probably is something in that it's incredibly enigmatic. You know, there is that smile and there is something quite almost entertaining about stealing that painting because that's part of the interest in it is the mystery. The act of stealing the painting and the fact that the painting was absent made the painting obviously much more famous. The theft remains a very dramatic story, but it's one of many stories around the Mona Lisa, many legends, many true stories and so on. She's still in the news. You know, every couple of weeks, they're digging up the body of the person they think is the Mona Lisa. There's another theory. There was just something that says the copy of the Mona Lisa that's in the Prado was done at the same time, and if you put them together, it's a 3D image. This is 500 years later after she's been painted, and she's still getting press. ultimate enigma. He created some of the world's most treasured paintings, including the girl with a pearl earring. But we know very little about him. In fact, for two centuries, his masterpieces were largely forgotten. But an intrepid French explorer in the 19th century managed to hunt them down in hidden locations, where they'd been scattered across Europe. You don't hear people making these pilgrimages for most artists. And what is it about Vermeer that encourages this need? Slowly but surely, Vermeer came to be appreciated for the artistic genius that he was. 
for me, is one of the most enigmatic Dutch artists of the 17th century. Once you see a Vermeer, you never forget it. And you never forget where you saw it. However, the process of reclaiming his paintings has been fraught with peril. One of the most successful forgers of all time, Han van Meegren, managed to fool the experts for years with his collection of fake Vermeers. His trial was a media sensation that rocked the art world. It seems astonishing to us now that we were fooled by the Van Meegren fakes. It's wishful thinking. You really want a painting to be Vermeer. If you just want it, you know, it will be. He was just a brilliant you know, psychologist, and he understood that scholars would think, we've always been expecting to find these, and here they are. There are very few genuine Vermeers around, and many have been lost to us once again, being stolen by members of the IRA and the Boston mob. It would appear that they were very selective in what they took. Even Adolf Hitler and Hermann Goering were looking to get their hands on Vermeers by whatever means necessary. Hitler managed to get a hold of two. Goering was sold a fake, made by Van Meegren. The forgeries have made life difficult when it comes to the work of the Dutch master. If you would discover a genuine Vermeer, it would make your day. But you have to be really careful. It's been an epic struggle to reclaim the works of Johannes Vermeer from their hidden locations and from the thieves that took them. That struggle continues today. At the end of World War II, Joseph Piller, a Jewish resistance hero, was tasked with hunting down SS and Gestapo members after the liberation of the Netherlands. He also managed to track down Han van Meegren, a very wealthy resident of Amsterdam who he discovered had been behind the sales of many recently rediscovered Vermeers. But one of those sales had been made to the Nazi leader Hermann Goering, and van Meegren was accused of collaboration. You can answer the question, Mr. Van Meegeren. My father told me I would never amount to anything. He didn't approve of your career? I know nothing, he used to say. I'm capable of nothing. Well, he was wrong, wasn't he? A man doesn't acquire 50 houses. 52. Yes, 52. You had to be clever to do what you did. Yes. Where did they come from, Mr. Van Meegeren? Where did you find the Vermeers? But what Piller didn't know was that Van Meegren was one of the most successful art forgers of all time. Just like Johannes Vermeer himself, Van Meegren lived and worked in the city of Delft and was also an artist. But he was chastised by art critics at the time. They said his style was just an imitation of the old masters. Van Meegren decided to retaliate by proving that he could imitate them so accurately that even the experts would be fooled. I think he had two motives. One was obviously money. Uh, it was a way of earning some money by uh, making these fakes. But I also think he wanted to get his own back on the art world. They didn't like his art, um, so he thought he would do something to get his own back on the critics. Van Meegren was a Dutch Delft architect who has some, made some buildings in Delft as well. So around Delft, you will find some real Van Meegerens. They are buildings uh, alongside canals. Van Meegeren discovered he could make wonderful Vermeers with the kind of paint Vermeer uh, used in his time. And people from that area liked it very much and thought the possibility to, to own a real Vermeer. Han van Meegeren made forgeries of other artists. But it was the fact that Johannes Vermeer was such a mystery that allowed these fakes to be so successful. 
Johannes Vermeer was born in Delft in 1632, exactly 300 years before Van Meegren started his fakes. He joined the Artistic Guild of St. Luke and may have been taught by another celebrated artist who worked in Delft, Carol Fabricius. Fabricius was Rembrandt's greatest pupil, but was tragically killed at the age of 32 when a gunpowder store exploded in Delft, destroying much of the city. The event became known as the Delft Thunderclap. Vermeer survived the gunpowder explosion and started working on his paintings, including a view of Delft made six years after the tragedy. We know very little about his life. Um, he actually ran um, an inn or tavern in the uh, town of Delft outside The Hague. The city of Delft in the 17th century was very rich. We did business all over the world. Wonderful buildings, already stone, but also a lot of, a lot of wooden houses. He was a Dutch golden age painter, that great flowering of you know, the Dutch Republic. We think Vermeer was in the middle class of, of people. His mother-in-law was very rich, of course. His father had two, uh, two inns. It always sounds as though he suffered from his father, who um, had been a, a cloth worker and dealer and became a tavern keeper and killed a soldier and was generally sounds like a rogue. Um, married a Catholic, had 15 children, 11 of which survived. One imagines his life didn't look anything like a Vermeer. Maybe that was the point. We have no definitive pictures of Johannes Vermeer, but it's believed by scholars that he may have painted himself into one of his early works, the Procurus. It's a genre scene where you have a figure in the background and he looks like a painter and, you know, he may be Vermeer. Uh, I, I like to think it is Vermeer, but, you know, uh, we don't know that for sure. Vermeer may also have painted himself into one of his later works the art of painting. He had other jobs, so, you know, he earned his money as a painter, but he had an inn and uh, he dealt in art, so he was an art dealer. He had 11 children uh, with his wife. He was also an innkeeper. He had, he had the two inns of his father. He was a seller of antiques and that, that kind of things. And oh, he was a painter as well. How the poor man find time to paint at all is a miracle. Some very successful artists, like Rembrandt, had a studio and employed a lot of assistants who would work doing some menial task. But Vermeer seems to have worked just by himself. And that's probably a reflection of both of the way he wanted to work and the fact that he didn't earn very much money. You know, there's a great idea that uh, great suffering makes great art. Vermeer's unique way of working and the materials he used seem to explain why there are so precious few examples of his paintings in the world today. I think it's a combination of two reasons why we have such a very small output. One is that we simply don't have the paintings, that they were lost, because of course a lot of pictures do get lost and some of his must have done. The other thing is he probably did work very slowly. I mean, they're very meticulously and carefully painted. He painted using lapis lazuli quite, quite a lot, and he painted gem-like pictures that were made out of gems often. Vermeer used very expensive uh, colors, the, the stone lapis lazuli. In those years, it was very expensive. Because he produced so little, he probably uh, didn't earn a great deal. And there were also economic problems in the Netherlands at the time. And when he died, he was in debt. Vermeer died in Delft at the age of just 43. His reputation as an artist did not extend much beyond his hometown, and his name faded into obscurity very quickly, along with his paintings. It was not until almost two centuries later that he finally got the recognition that he deserved when a French exile made it his mission to bring Vermeer to the world. Johannes Vermeer lived and painted in the city of Delft near The Hague. But his reputation as an artist didn't extend much beyond the city he worked in. And when he died at the age of 43, it seemed Vermeer had missed his chance to be considered one of history's greatest artists. I don't imagine that his pictures sold for much, and there weren't very many of them. If you're painting probably two pictures a year, that's not like being Picasso. In those times, Rembrandt and, and some other painters, also in Delft, from Mierveld and Pieter de Hoog, for instance, uh, sold a lot more paintings to other people than Vermeer did. The volume of the work available is a 
key component in this. Even accounting for ones that may have been lost or destroyed even, it's still a relatively small output for someone who was an artist for over 20 years. In those years, it was not very common to like a Vermeer. The prices which were paid on the, the selling in Amsterdam were also not so very high, for instance. There were no paintings by Vermeer in French public collections. I think the Vermeer in the Mauritz House was the first Vermeer to enter a public collection in the Netherlands. So if you have these paintings in private collections, if you had good contacts, you could go there, but it's different from a museum. There were a few collectors of his work and they were saved by them. Often they were later attributed to other artists, not to Vermeer. And then Vermeer was rediscovered um, in the mid-19th century. Vermeer's rediscovery was due to a French exile named Théophile Torre, who found himself captivated by the paintings. Torre made it his life's work to track down as many Vermeers as he could. It wasn't going to be an easy task, though. After Vermeer's death, his paintings had scattered across Europe and were often incorrectly listed as the work of far better known artists at the time. Many of them would end up in royal possession. In 1742, a girl reading a letter by an open window was acquired for Augustus III, the King of Poland, with the belief that it was a painting by Rembrandt. The music lesson was also bought by a king in 1762 when it was purchased for King George III of England. It entered the royal collection at Buckingham Palace where it was listed as being by Franz van Meeris. In 1802, the guitar player became the property of Lord Palmerston, who would go on to become Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. The art of painting, Vermeer's most treasured item that he always kept in his possession, would end up being listed as a work by Peter de Hoog. It travelled to Vienna, where it became part of the House of Chernin collection in 1813. The little street and the milkmaid stayed in the Netherlands, though, when they entered the collection of the aristocratic Dutch family, the Sixes, at the House of Six in Amsterdam. Vermeer. Jan Vermeer. I had never heard the name before either, but it was simply astonishing. The first one I saw was at The Hague. The brilliance of the light, the intensity of the color, both real and utterly original. I had to know who painted it. He went to the Margaret's house in The Hague in 1842, saw this huge panorama on Delft, and, well, he was blown away immediately by this incredible painting. The view of Delft is an amazing picture, very beautifully painted. I can see that it was a landscape which would certainly have appealed uh, to people in the 19th century. I searched every gallery in Holland I knew, every one. I found two more in private collections. Again, simply astounding work. This was art concerned with the real. Uh, servants at work, the town where he lived, unadorned. This was art for man. He traveled all over the place and discovered new paintings. The only thing I can get to know is by reading what he left us, and it's almost a diary of his travels. He drew up a list of works which he felt were by Vermeer and identified quite a lot of them for the first time. We had wondered what you got up to during your time away. A mistress or two, my brother thought. <laughs> we never thought you'd fallen in love. Love is selfish, Isaac. I could not keep Vermeer to myself. In fact, that was the reason I asked you here. Isaac Pereira was a wealthy Parisian financier and art collector. Torre hoped that he could convince Pereira to purchase one of the Vermeers he'd found. It was 1866, and Torre was publishing his findings in the Gazette des Beaux-Arts. 
This was for him like the starting point for like you have a Rembrandt research project, he had a Vermeer research project, and I think it took him the rest of his life to, to do this. He wrote an article in the Gazette des Arts, which is a kind of groundbreaking essay on Vermeer, his oeuvre, and, uh, and his life. 1866 is sort of the key date. He was published in the Gazette des Beaux-Arts, which increased everyone's awareness uh, of him as an artist of, um, and of his works. He really writes everything, how he went to The Hague, how he saw the painting, how he had never heard of Van der Meer de Delft. Torre had actually bought several Vermeers for himself during his travels, but he was hoping that Pereira would purchase the geographer to help establish Vermeer's name. A Vermeer in your collection would transform the way people think of him. See how the scholar grips the book as if caught in the very moment of inspiration. He doesn't want to let it go. And his understanding of light, Isaac. It is a very fine piece. This doesn't do it justice. The scholar's cloak is blue, but the deepest blue you could imagine. You must have it. You must. I'm sorry. Pereira would soon be persuaded, though, and Vermeer's would quickly become a must-have item for the world's wealthiest collectors. Pereira was a very well-known collector. You have the publication in the Gazette des Beaux-Arts, so all the, the connoisseurs read that. Of course, all the collectors read this. And if there is a new discovery of a new name, then of course everybody wants to own a Vermeer, and Pereira was no exception to that. Why don't you buy it yourself? The old master has demanded much of me. He needs new advocates now. Well, he could have no finer ally. <laughs> and none more persuasive. <laughs> Show it to me again. It was thanks to Tori that we really rediscovered Vermeer and that sort of put him on the map, if you like. And then he became very collectible in the 20th century. But of course, at that time, it was very hard to come by. So these paintings were really expensive. And we know that at that time, even forgeries were made in the early 20th century. Forgeries had started to appear, but real discoveries were still being made. Torre had identified many of the Vermeers he found by the subtle and varying signatures that the artist used. That signature was then found on two paintings in the early 20th century, Diana and her companions and Christ in the house with Mary and Martha. They were very different from most of his known works, and if they didn't have signatures, it's unlikely they would ever have been attributed to Vermeer. Surprisingly, Vermeer's most famous work, The Girl with a Pearl Earring, was not identified by Torre before he died in 1869. However, it had not gone unnoticed by those who had seen it. The Girl of Pearl Earring is a fascinating story and as we know was, was sold for like six guilders or something incredible. Actually, it turns out it was more recognized at that time than you would think because it was from very early on really greatly admired by novelists. These are actually novelists who are writing stories, stories about traveling through the Netherlands. Early on it was recognized and then slowly becomes written about among the art, art historians of the world. The art historians believed that there were still more Vermeers to be found though, especially from his early career. And Han van Meegren saw an opportunity. His Vermeer fakes made in the 1930s were hugely successful. And his career as an art forger would have probably continued if he hadn't sold one of them to Hermann Goering. Sir, Goering's man, he's been found. Has he talked yet? I don't know, sir, that's all we have. Han van Meegren, in a desperate attempt to save his own skin, 
was about to send the art world into a panic when he revealed his deception. He was put on trial where he had to prove himself guilty of forgery rather than face conviction of Nazi collaboration. When World War II came to an end, it was discovered that Hitler had stashed away many priceless artworks for his own private collection. He'd even managed to get hold of two Vermeers, including the astronomer and the art of painting. Hermann Goering, it seemed, had also got hold of a Vermeer, and the trail led right back to Han van Meegren. Your German friend, Meedle. He's been arrested, hiding in Spain. He's no friend of mine. Well, he's had plenty to say about you. Van Meegren was accused of, of selling a painting to Goering and uh, collaborating with the Nazis. Unusually for Goering, he actually paid for it, a relatively decent sum of money from an art dealer who either genuinely believed that it was a, a Vermeer or must have been crapping his pants. I mean, really, you know, knowing that you're selling a, a fake to, to Goering isn't a very safe thing to do. And in order to avoid that charge, he said that he'd sold a fake. So this is how the whole thing came out into the open. He says that you came to him, Goering's art dealer, with the sole purpose of doing business with the Nazis. That is a lie. You swear to it. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. On oath. He's, he's lying. No, he isn't. The simple fact, Mr. Van Meegeren, is we don't need to talk to you anymore. This will convict you for collaboration. Though naturally, any cooperation you might offer at this point would be considered when it came to sentencing. Where did you get the Vermeers, Mr. Van Meegeren? Where did you take them from? Who helped you? No one! No one helped me. I did it. I painted them. I painted them all. Being accused of forgery was a far lesser crime than collaboration with the Nazis. But Van Meegren would have to prove that these newly discovered Vermeers were, in fact, fakes. And so a trial was conducted where, oddly, Van Meegren had to prove himself guilty rather than innocent of a crime. It seems astonishing to us now that we were fooled by the Van Meegren fakes. Um, but they were accepted by some of the, the top experts in Dutch art, including Bradius. And um, once one or two experts had accepted, the others seemed to. The touch Van Meegen used 
just not not to 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 make something Vermeer is very famous for, but making it look like it could be a Vermeer. People were so eager to to have those paintings. It is not easy to admit when you've been made a fool of. You laid a trap for us, Mr. Van Meegeren. It was a clever one too. We wanted to walk into it. For your works seem to give us the answer to a mystery. They filled the chasm between early Vermeers like this one and his mature masterpieces. Our search for truth and beauty blinded us, and in the end, we were all caught out. He did a very clever thing, which was that he, he made Vermeers that didn't look like Vermeers, and that was really sensible. You know, if you'd done Girl with a Pearl Brooch, you could have held it up next to Girl with a Pearl Brooch, and said, mm, I don't think so. But in those days, scholars believed that Vermeer had studied in Italy, which he hadn't. Um, and so what he did was he painted a Caravaggio supper at Vermeers in the style of Vermeer, and every, you know, scholars, who saw with their brains rather than their eyes, thought, oh, well, this obviously, you know, we can explain this like this. And people were fooled. I would like to begin my analysis, if I may, with the supper at Emmaus. The pigment used by Mr. Van Meegeren, although chemically identical, is quite different when viewed under a microscope. It's always easy to be wise after the event because when you do a fake, there's something of your own time that goes into it and later on it looks wrong. Something that everybody wanted and you can wait. So I'm still waiting for the self-portrait of Vermeer to appear. Uh, but you have to imagine at that point in time, so there were a lot of monographs, the documents had been published, so everybody knew that there were more paintings. They were different from the Vermeers that we now know they were early religious works, it was said. So uh, Van Meegeren had tried to fill a hole in v Vermeer's career. This black substance, uh, a dye of some sort, imitating centuries accumulation of dirt, was used to further the illusion of age. It's wishful thinking, it's something you really want a painting to be Vermeer. If you just want it, you know, it will be. It's a brilliant con. You really saw what scholars were like, and they would just say, yes, you know, we've long suspected there were, there'd be Italianate pictures. And of course he was a Catholic, so, you know, here at last. Very clever forgery, meaning an old canvas was used and bakelite was used, so it really had the cacolade, you know, the, the, the cacolade pattern that you see in old master paintings. This X-ray reveals the remnants of the original painting below, a priming layer with patches of lead white paint here and here. I do think he was brilliant, Van Meegeren. Not a brilliant painter, a brilliant, I mean, material forger, but he was just a brilliant you know, psychologist. And of course, the next Van Meegeren that comes along and doesn't look like a Vermeer is not going to be compared with Vivo Delft. It's going to be compared with the last Van Meegeren. Van Meegeren was forced to paint a Vermeer fake in front of reporters and court-appointed witnesses to show exactly how it was done. I must thank Mr. Van Meegeren for his cooperation throughout this process. Indeed, I have never known a defendant so anxious to be found guilty. It's very easy for us to think these people were foolish to think it is a Vermeer because it's a terrible painting. I think many people know about Vermeer, but when you ask them the real story behind it, they don't know. You do admit to painting these works? Yes. And selling them at the exorbitant prices charged? If I'd have sold them cheaply, everyone would have known they were fake. <laughs> Everyone is interested in fakers, so it does give one a certain notoriety, and there is a great deal of interest in Van Meegeren, and some people like to have his work just because of who he was. Um, so there is a certain admiration for someone who got away with it for so long. What was it that made you continue after painting Emmaus? You had made your money. Why go on? It was the... Uh... 
satisfaction of deceiving good men like Dr. Cormans, of swindling them. The satisfaction of perfecting my technique. I couldn't stop myself. So money had no influence on your decision? Money has brought me nothing but misery. Of course, he's also very damaging to uh, Vermeer's work, and it's important to sort out what is the real Vermeer and what are the fakes. Han van Meegren died soon after the trial was completed and before he served any time in prison. The forgery scandal he created showed just how hard it's been to reclaim Vermeer's legacy. But in the decades that followed, many of the genuine articles were lost to us once again in daring heists. And one is still missing. Han van Meegren had forged numerous Vermeers for over a decade. His sensational trial in 1947 had proved an embarrassment for the scholars of Vermeer who had fallen for his deception. And as a result, one painting called A Young Woman Seated at the Virginals, which had been accepted as a Vermeer since 1904, was suddenly labelled yet another forgery. It was not until the 21st century that it started to be accepted once again. Well, I think that is a Vermeer. I didn't think so initially, although not all of what one sees is by Vermeer, as far as I'm concerned. There's been lots of technical analysis done in the painting uh, and to the canvas. Uh, and I think that strongly indicates, I believe, that it is Vermeer. She has a large yellow cloak that covers upper part of her body. You can see the, uh, the tin the yellow underneath layer and that the modeling of the underneath layer seems to me appropriate for Vermeer, whereas the modeling on the upper layer not. So I think that painting was reworked at a certain point for some reason. Some comments could be made on the quality of, for example, the depiction of her arms, but scientifically I think it's been proven that it, that it is part of his work, yes. The young woman seated at the Virginals suddenly became the only remaining Vermeer in private hands. All the others had become part of museum or state collections. And over the last few decades, they've been the target of some of the most notorious art thefts in history. In 1971, the love letter was taken from the Fine Arts Palace in Brussels, where it was on temporary exhibition. It was recovered two weeks later and returned to its home at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Another Vermeer that was stolen in the 1970s was the guitar player. Once owned by Prime Minister Lord Palmerston, this later work of the artist was taken from Kenwood House. The guitar player was stolen in 1974. Uh, Kenwood House um, is an isolated house in Hampstead Heath, so it was a bit vulnerable at that time. The person broke in through the window, through the shutters, into this, the room and stole the Vermeer specifically, ran off with it, wasn't caught. There was various theories. There's been links made to IRA and that demands were made to transfer prisoners from a prison. Also, there was a, a ransom note saying they were going to burn it on St. Patrick's night. Uh, however, it ended with an anonymous tip-off. It was later found abandoned in the churchyard in Smithfield in central London. A helpful phone call, ring, ring. Hello, you don't know me, but there's a, there's a Vermeer in your churchyard. When I arrived here about a quarter of an hour ago, I found a lot of press here saying that the painting had been found. And of course, I was absolutely thrilled because it was so terrible that it had ever been stolen, really. There it was, propped up against a, a, a gravestone. It was damp, but relatively unharmed. It has slightly suffered from the atmospheric conditions while it's been away from us, and this is hardly surprising. Um, a skilled restorer will have to see to the very slight cupping of the paint surface that has occurred. I seem to recall that they stole some other pictures from Kenwood and dumped them down by the lake and made off, so leaving the things in the wet grass wasn't, wasn't unusual for them. Obviously not a professional thief did it. There's not much point in taking a picture and then just leaving it in a churchyard. I should think possibly if anyone wanted to leave anything without being seen anywhere in the city of London at night, it's rather a good place because it's all very deserted. Very few people live around here, you see. It's the only uh, Vermeer that is still on its original or very early stretcher. So uh, it is unique and it's very special and we have to take 
obviously extra, extra care of it because uh, it's uh, quite fragile. This picture was on its original 17th century stretcher and there's no mistaking that. Uh, there's no mistaking the original wooden dowels around the uh, edge of the canvas too. They are, of course, are the pegs that Vermeer put in. Today, artists have used galvanized tacks, so we can be absolutely certain. It's amazing that this is, you know, still on its, its same stretcher from 1672. The same year as the guitar player was stolen, yet another Vermeer was taken, the lady writing a letter with her maid. It's the only Vermeer in Ireland and had to endure a second theft in the 1980s. The lady writing a letter with her maid was stolen in Ireland um, in the 1970s and the IRA was involved. That was at the height of the Troubles. Uh, that was also recovered. It was stolen from Rusborough House outside Dublin. There was a wonderful sort of figure of my childhood called Dr Rose Dugdale, who was a sort of debutante turned IRA terrorist who, um, you know, she stole it first and they found it about a week later. I think it's unfair to say the IRA was responsible, no. At the time, Bridget Rose Dugdale and her boyfriend Eddie Gallagher were not just Irish nationalists, but they were paramilitary sympathizers. Their big idea was to get these things and then hold them to ransom as much as you can establish a motive for the theft of those paintings, both in Kenwood and at Rusborough. The painting was stolen a second time in the 1980s by uh, a criminal from uh, Northern Ireland, and it was recovered in Antwerp. The painting is back and now at the National Gallery of Ireland in Dublin. Fortunately, all these stolen Vermeers have been returned to their rightful homes. But one is still missing, the concert. This was taken from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, along with a painting by one of Vermeer's contemporaries, Rembrandt in one of the most daring art thefts of all time. The concert was taken in 1990, along uh, with Rembrandt and a number of other important works from the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. On the night of St. Patrick's Day, 1990, two Boston Police Department cops turned up at the museum, banged on the door, the guys walked in, produced a gun, tied up the two guards, then spent several hours in the museum deciding what to take. Certainly, the concert of him there, and also Rembrandt's Storm on the Sea of Galilee are two exceptionally valuable paintings, taken away in a, over a matter of hours, and they haven't been seen since. Most important works that are stolen do eventually turn up, but this one is now 20 or more years ago, um, but the hunt is still on. The problem has been that the FBI have gone down one road, and I think there were other roads to go down. For years, the theft has been linked to James Whitey Bulger, a notorious figure in Boston organized crime who was captured in 2011. The Whitey Bulger story is the story. He was the kingpin. I cannot see how it's possible that Whitey did not have, either at the time or certainly soon afterwards, some connection to those paintings. However, to be fair to the FBI, there is no hard evidence of that. Well, I've been very lucky that I've actually studied Every Vermeer in the world under the microscope, I've seen it out of the frame. And the concert I spent two days with in that way. And I still have all these slides of the painting and all the kind of uh, little magical ways in which he, these colored highlights. And it's always a huge loss that I still feel. I hope it will come back. I hope it will come back because for the museum, it's very sad that you don't have uh, the work itself anymore. The hunt for the concert goes on. But it's not the only missing Vermeer that could be out there. Vermeer died in poverty, and most of his works were later auctioned off in a 1696 sale of a man called Jacob Dicius, who had inherited 21 of Vermeer's paintings. Some of the works listed in the auction catalogue haven't been found yet, and include another little street, and even a self-portrait of the artist. I'm still looking uh, for the self-portrait that he made because it is documented that he made one and we know there was a second little street like the painting in the Rijksmuseum. So uh, maybe paintings will turn up, but it's not really the largest production. It would be absolutely incredible, I mean, if we would be able to find one of these paintings that have been mentioned in the Odysseus sale in 1696 already, but have completely disappeared. One painting that wasn't listed in the Odysseus sale, but has been attributed to Vermeer for a while, is the Saint Praxedis. 
In 2014, Christie's in London auctioned the painting after announcing that technical analysis carried out at the Rijksmuseum strengthened the case that this is a genuine Vermeer. Thank you. We move on to lot 39. Please know that there is additional literature that's been posted throughout the view. Lot 39, the Vermeer. It may even be his earliest known work, as the lead isotope tests on the white paint of the St. Praxedis indicate that the exact same batch of white paint may have been used on both this painting and Diana and her companions. I actually did see that painting. It was in an exhibition in Rome, I think, two years ago. And it's a very um, difficult painting to attribute because this Praxedis saint she is depicted by Felice Ficarelli, an Italian painter, and then there is a copy after that painting. And it's very difficult if there is a copy, like who made this copy? The St. Praxedis picture is very unusual. Um, there's a signature on it which is thought to be um, Vermeer's, and it appears to be a copy of an Italian painting. And there is one scholar in America, Arthur Wheelock, who believes that it's an authentic Vermeer. I feel very strongly it is by Vermeer. And, um, and I've had the opportunity to study that one very closely and also to see it together with the Ficarelli painting. And they're, to me, they're entirely different and a very different character. One very much a Dutch painting and one very much an Italian painting. And there are a lot of elements of the St. Brixitis that are consistent with early Vermeer. The complicated thing, obviously, is based on another painting. Um, and so many of the elements of it are have this Italian quality that people aren't comfortable with in Vermeer's world. We're still hoping there will be more Vermeer's. And, and then there is also the thing, is it a real Vermeer or not? Because that's everyone, every time a Vermeer pops up, or uh, yeah, you, you'll get those questions. At three million, three million two hundred thousand. Three million five hundred thousand, three million eight hundred thousand. Now, at three million eight, yes, four million. We have no other copies of paintings by Vermeer. So this will be unique if it is a full-size copy of a painting. 4,200,000, yes, 4,500,000, 4,800,000, 4,800,000 parts. It's unclear as to why he would have wanted to copy this particular painting. And stylistically, um, it's been questioned as whether it's uh, consistent with Vermeer's work. Five million 500,000 pounds, last chance, sold, thank you, for 5,500,000. Just like the lady seated at the Virginals, scientific tests seem to be bringing another painting back into his canon. It's been quite a battle trying to rescue the legacy of Johannes Vermeer. Arguments will continue over the attribution of some of the paintings, including the unique Saint Praxedis. But even if no new Vermeers do turn up, the few paintings we do have continue to entrance people all across the globe. The mystery of Vermeer goes on. There's always a chance that something might emerge. I think it's a little bit unlikely at this stage because he's been famous for a hundred years. But who knows, something might emerge. I mean, you can hope, but he's so well known now that I'd be surprised if something came up new that wasn't already known. But you never know in a private collection. It may appear in future years. Today, one of the real absolute stars of what the Dutch Golden Age in painting was, um, but also a painter with a very tiny little oeuvre. Once you see a Vermeer, you never forget it. And you never forget where you saw it. The milkmaid, or you see the view of Delft, or you see the girl with the pearl earring, or you see the woman with the balance in the National Gallery, the woman in blue. I mean, you name it. It's, it's magical to watch the, the, the power of this artist. But the most important thing is they are all such distinctive images.